Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console, Xbox. I'm said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of October 10th, 2024, including Halo Developer 343 have changed their name and announced big changes coming to the Halo franchise moving forward. The U.S. government is forcing Google to open its app store to third parties, making way for an Xbox mobile game store. I played Starfield Shattered Spaces, so let's get into the discourse surrounding that game and more. I swear it's always right as I hit record on the podcast every fucking week. I mean, everyone's getting so many of these text messages. I know it's not just me, but like, you know, the, the political spam text you get from these random numbers. This one says Act Blue is going wild for Kamala. If we, what the fuck, is if we raise 100K, Trump is done. Rush $20 for Blue Victory Fund before 3X match expires. Like, that's not even like, it, it started off kind of normal. Like, hey, Democrats need your support. Can we, can we? trust that you're going to vote blue this november and then it's just got it's got more and more unhinged like demon dragons need 3x gold in order to release trump from the clutches of evil it's like what the fuck is this message even talking about hey can i can i can i confide in you guys something uh i i learned mostly about the marvel character uh, uh kamala khan who is miss marvel around the same time that uh the Kamala Harris rose to political power and became vice president. And so in my head, every time I, I think about one or the other, I have to be sure. Am I talking about the vice president or am I talking about the Marvel superhero? Um, so it's always it's always a little bit of a, of a brain teaser for me to try to figure out. Anyway, welcome to Xbox on you guys. On this day in Xbox history, last year in the year 2023, Forza Motorsport was released for Xbox Series consoles. I remember playing about maybe three hours at most of this game <laughs> and being like, I like it. I don't know why Forza fans are always bitching about everything these days, but I never got back to it. So I got nothing to say about that game. I liked Forza Motorsport. I feel like in the early Xbox One era, when I had like a little more free time for gaming and there were fewer games to play, you know, like the Xbox One era is interesting because it's like I had more disposable income than I did when I was in like middle school and high school, so I could play pretty much any game I wanted to play, unlike when I was younger on the Xbox 360, but I also had fewer responsibilities than I do now. It was like that sweet like college years, you know, where it's like I have responsibility, but enough free time that I can kind of play whatever I want, and I'm not, I, you know, I'm not well off, I'm not like set, but... I got, you know, some disposable income because I work when I'm not at, at school. So it was like that kind of sweet spot of like, I can pretty much just play whatever fucking game I want because I'm a college student. Xbox series generation is more like there are 8.5 million video games coming out every single week that I want to play. There's no time to play it. PlayStation fans are bitching at me, telling me I have no games on my platform. I'm overwhelmed at the prospect of even thinking about a backlog. And all the while, you know, we're celebrating the first anniversary of this game that I've been meaning to get around to trying for like 12 months. It's, it's, it's wild. But uh, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel like back in those Xbox One days, Forza Motorsport 5 for the Xbox One, no problem. Let me pick it up. Let me dump 10 to 20 hours in this game. See what Forza is all about. I, I can make it happen, you know. But nowadays, it's like 2023, 2024, new Forza Motorsport comes out. Dude, I'll be, I'll be lucky if I get to put 5 to 10 hours in the game, in like my favorite game of the year, let alone forza motorsport you know so I, I don't know but i remember enjoying what little of it i experienced i'm not versed enough in that if i'm gonna make time for a forza game it's gonna be forza horizon because i just i just prefer that that more uh arcadey car layman uh, pr uh, you know um friendly kind of a uh, version of the game more as it seems like most people do anyway guys mike clark writes in starts us off this week and says xbox on podcast the podcast now being remastered in unreal engine 5 a little foreshadowing there fantastic program as usual jesse take care as there's severe weather headed for the land of mickey mouse severe severe weather yes uh yeah so i'm recording this on wednesday as i always do but rather than recording at like 7 p.m i'm recording at 11 a.m so this is nice it's unusual I'm freshly showered. I'm in clean clothes. 
I haven't gone through a full 10 to 14 hour workday. That's, that's just completely distracted me from anything in my world other than my day job. So it's nice. I feel refreshed. I feel energized. Uh, but obviously the circumstances are a little weird. Yep. We're about to get a huge hurricane here in Florida. Now I want to say, first of all, thank you to the listeners, the family, the friends who've reached out. Hey, is everything okay? Hey, you can always come up here. If something happens. Hey, do you guys have everything you need? I really do appreciate that. I think it, it, it's a very, you know, hurt. Living in Florida and having hurricanes is is one of the few things in life that reminds me. It's like, oh, yeah, people care about you. That's nice. Uh, so thank you. But, uh, yeah, thank, luckily, you know, knock on wood, pretty safe here, pretty far inland, uh, the greater Orlando area. The nice thing about living here is um, it's it's pretty much, I don't know if it's the safest, but it's definitely one of the safer parts of Florida to be in um, as far as, like, natural disasters. You know, anywhere on the water, obviously, is worth. South Florida, God forbid, uh, <laughs> the West Coast, the Tampa Bay area. Uh, which fucking sucks. I, I always say it's like, peop, you know, I love Orlando. I love Disney. I love living near Disney. If I could live anywhere in the state of Florida, it would not be Orlando. Even if I had to be far away from Disney, I would do it. Tampa Bay is by far my favorite part of the state of Florida. I love Tampa. I love all the cities around Tampa. Um, St. Pete in the greater area, the Clearwater area. All that, I love that. I love downtown Tampa. Tampa's a great city. It's one of my favorite cities in the U.S. I would never in a million years live there for two reasons, and it's not nothing to do with being further away from Disney. It's simply because the city is way too fucking expensive, and no way in hell would I ever invest in real estate that close to fucking Category 3, 4, 5 hurricanes on an annual basis. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. The number of people who have money, and it's like you just assume, it's like, oh, you got a lot of money, you must be somewhat not retarded right you get you made all this fucking money you can afford a two million dollar home in tampa you can't be that stupid in your fucking brain and these motherfuckers still go eh, i think i'm gonna buy property on the west coast of florida it's like you fucking idiot you stupid son of a bitch so i i just not only can i not afford it i just couldn't justify it even if i had the money like living in tampa are you kidding me ah it's insane but um no, we should be relatively good here. Looks like as of this morning, the hurricanes moved just a little south, so it is still kind of like directly coming towards where I live. But by the time it reaches us, it should be Category One hurricane. Um, and yeah, it should be all things considered okay. I'm not in a flood zone. We got plenty of supplies here, and uh, lucky to lucky to work for a company that uh, isn't forcing me to be in the office right now. Like I know that's not everyone's circumstance, so I, I'm grateful for you know the opportunity to uh, <laughs> properly react to the storm. So we should be all good here. By the time you're listening to this podcast, the storm will have already passed. So can you imagine the storm comes through and like everything is untouched except for my Xbox? Like my Xbox gets somehow just fucking washed away by the storm. I'll, uh, I'll definitely blame the PlayStation fanboys if that happens. It will definitely be blood on your hands. So anyway, guys, let's move into the podcast. No one cares about that shit. Let's talk about the real shit that's going on here. There's some games coming to Xbox. If you're thinking to yourself, oh boy, Jesse talking about how he doesn't have time to play in the games he wants has me really stressed out about my backlog. Allow me to add just a little more anxiety to the plate because we got a couple games I want to mention here. If you're a fucking idiot who plays video games on a PC because you think the place where you do expense reports and taxes and fucking naked boys on the internet, then I got a game for you. It's called Diablo 4 The Vessel of Hatred Ultimate Edition. It's the new expansion. I don't care. It's October 8th. We're past October 8th, so you're probably already playing it on your PC while you got one monitor with a naked boy. You got one monitor with a YouTube tutorial on how to play Minecraft. You got one monitor with your day job, and you're like, oh, I got so much processing power. Look at all the tabs. It's like, shut the fuck up, dude. I'm sitting on the couch. I'm watching hockey because the NHL season just kicked off. I got my fucking Logitech G Cloud, and I'm playing Starfield on it. Fuck you, dude. I got a better setup than you. I am better than you. All right. Uh, now that we're being humble, let's move on to our second game. Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. I know this is a big game for Dragon Ball fans. This is supposed to be like the return to form for fans of like the Tenkaichi and Budokai games from back in the back in the heyday, back in what was that, like the PS2, Xbox, maybe early 360 years, like when those games were coming out. I know that that's those are like really seminal fighting games for fans and for fighting game fans and for Dragon Ball fans. So while I have Negative 12% interest in these games. I'm just happy for those people because I know this is a big deal. And from what I've seen cursory, it looks like the early reception is like, hey, this game's pretty fucking good. So good for you guys. It always makes me happy to see someone get, you know, get more of that thing that they miss and that they're nostalgic for and that meant a lot to them because, man, I would just be over the moon if we got Sonic Unleashed 2. That would be 
so so cool so happy for you guys uh metaphor re fantasio this is probably the biggest game coming out this week obviously this is the brand new game from the creators of the persona series um this game was marketed heavily as an xbox game it is a game pass game it is a play anywhere title it is game pass right no, huh, no, it's not coming to Game Pass. It's just it just had a marketing deal with Xbox. This game also does notably have a free 10-hour demo that's available, and your progress on the demo does carry over to the game if you purchase it. So there's at least that. I mean, you don't really need Game Pass to test a game out um, if, if you got a free 10-hour demo. Uh, but obviously, if you're hoping to play the entire game, uh, you're gonna have to buy this game for 70 bucks. But uh, earlier reviews uh, say that it's pretty fucking good this game comes out on friday the 11th so look forward to that if you're a jrpg fan it's cool that like this is like a day and date game from the persona team um from atlas from the persona guys um for xbox but man i would so much i'd so much rather play persona i just eh, like the weird fantasy alternative weird universe they're making here just it doesn't do anything for me so it's all it's all mystical it's all fairy like i just i don't i don't do well with that stuff i prefer the modern day tokyo kind of thing but um in any case these games just aren't for me i tried persona 5 i I tried to make it work i tried to see what was so special about it and while i do think there's a lot of artistic charm and goddamn yeah people are right that music that music's really good persona games really good music I just, I, I, I can't with the games. They're just not for me. But that's okay. That's what we got Yakuza for. Uh, all right. Two more games here. Star Troopers Extermination. If you are coping like I am and you just won't buy a PS5 and you're so hellbent on the Xbox platform and you don't have access to Helldivers 2, Star Troopers Extermination is a poor man's uh, uh, great value version of Helldivers that you can play. Uh, fully licensed 16-player co-op FPS. Which What's so funny about this is that Helldivers is clearly a riff off of Star Starship Troopers, but in the video game space, a Starship Troopers video game is like a poor man's uh, Helldivers. So that's just kind of a funny, kind of a, little, a funny observation, I guess, if you will. I don't know what the reaction to this game is. I don't know if it's good or not. I know there have been good Starship Trooper games. I don't know if this is maybe that Star Starship Troopers game that came to PC a year or two ago that people actually said was pretty damn good. So I don't know if this is just an Xbox version of that game or if it's something entirely different, but maybe this is something worth looking into. I don't, again, I don't know if, if, if the word is that this game is any good or not, but there's that, you know, you fucking hell diver hold, holder honors on the Xbox platform saying maybe one day, no, you got starship troopers. Uh, and lastly, this one, this one's sure to be a shit game, but I'm going to put it in here because this is for me. This is okay. Shut up. This is for me. Transformers Galactic Trials comes to Xbox Series platforms. Uh, it doesn't look like it's coming to Xbox One, which is surprising. For $40, created by OutRun Games, this is clearly some fucking shovelware, schlocky, cheap license garbage. Uh, comes out this Friday, October 11th. I think this game looks terrible, and I'm definitely going to buy it. I'm probably not going to buy it right away because I'm balls deep in some Starfield and Marvel's Marvel's Midnight Suns action right now. So not getting to this game immediately, but for 40 bucks, I'd give it a go. So this is probably the next thing on my list. Um, Very much looking forward to trying this. Very well aware. It's probably not good. Um, Yeah, it's like a racing Transformers game, but then it also has battling as well. The the multiple trailers they put out for this game does not do a great job explaining what exactly it is. Like it's single player. It's multiplayer. Play as Autobots, play as Decepticons. I'm like, okay, but what is the fucking game? And then it looks like it's a Mario Kart racing knockoff, but then there's also battles where you run around and you shoot things and you blast stuff because you're a Transformer. So not really sure what to make of what this game is. Pretty sure it's going to be garbage. I do hate that we live in an era where if a video game is licensed, it's only one extreme or the other. There is no middle ground. I feel like in my youth, we had a whole spectrum of licensed games where it's like a new Marvel game, a new Transformers game, a new new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, a new Batman game. It could be anywhere from horrible to okay to pretty good to amazing. You know, that was the spectrum of licensed games back in the day. But nowadays, I feel like there's only two options. It's like you either get something that's amazing, like like Insomniac Spider-Man or, you know, or like the Batman Arkham games or something, or you get something that is utter trash, like these no-name developer Transformers G.I. Joe outrun game fucking nonsense. Or what was that? The 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 King Kong game that came out last last year that was like infamous for how ridiculous and unfinished it was, or or Lord of the Rings Gollum or any of that. Why, why do we only get one or the other? Where Where's the middle ground? I, 
I'll gladly take a 7 out of 10 Transformers game. Anything. Just don't 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 feed me this schlock. I'll, I'm, I'll still I'll still buy it because I'm an idiot, but you know. Uh, I just saw Transformers 1 finally. Uh, I can't believe it took a few weeks to get around to it, but boy, that movie was so much better than it had any right being. That dude, side note, that movie had terrible trailers. I had the worst expectations for that movie going in. And then I and then I went and saw it. Uh fucking awesome. Pop. This isn't saying much because Transformers movies usually aren't pretty good, although I enjoy them. Probably the best Transformers movie ever. You know, or at least, you know, since the 1985 animated movie. But anyway, uh, shout out to Transformers. Such an underexplored, underappreciated franchise, I swear to God. G.I. Joe's, Transformers, even, dude, even X-Men if we're talking about video games. It's like, what, what, what are we doing here, dude? We're falling over. Why is every fucking developer falling over themselves left and right. Can I make a shitty Star Wars game? Oh, I want to make a shitty Star Wars game. Ooh, 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 Star Wars, please. I have so many ideas for Star Wars. It takes place during Luke Skywalker. Shut up. Will someone give us a fucking Transformers game, please? Why can't we get a AAA? I, I know Insomniac's working on a Wolverine game. Why can't we get a AAA X-Men game? What the fuck is... Does, is everyone so deeply inspired by Star Wars that we all have to fail... A million times over of, of trying to one up Attack of the Clones. We're well, not Attack of the Clones. What's the one everyone likes? Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. It's like, can we fucking. We get it. We get it. You were a child in the 80s. You want to make a video game set in between those two movies. And then the game sucks. Can we just stop? Someone. Some, like, dude, what, what about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Isn't someone making. The, the last Ronin game or whatever, that um that Ninja Turtles comic book where, like, all the turtles but one are dead. But, you know, isn't that... What happened to that? Is that game still coming? Dude, just fucking... It's cool. We And we get some cool retro stuff, for sure, like Shredder's Revenge and all that. Grateful for it. But where is, like, the... Where is the Batman Arkham game for Transformers? What the fuck is going on? Can you just... Ubisoft. You're French. What the fuck makes you think you can make a Star Wars game? You're a bunch of Frenchmen. You guys gotta get real, man. This is a wake-up call. This is a sobering call, okay? All right, doesn't, doesn't matter what I'll think. I'll be wiped away in 13 hours. All right, uh, let's move on. We're already getting on our soapbox, and we're only like 12 minutes in. Mildly amusing stories. No corrections updates, although I guess I, I should have the correction that uh, last week I said, oh, it looks like early impressions for Starfield Shattered Space is that the game's pretty good. And I guess this is the part where everyone starts pretending like they liked Starfield all along. Then come to find out like within within like a day of recording that podcast that everyone <laughs> hates Shattered Space. So definitely uh, something I was wrong about. But we'll, we'll get into that when we get to what I've been playing because I have been playing uh, Shattered Space. But let's start off with the mildly amusing stories, your appetizers. This is the this is no everything at the top of the show. We're talking about game releases. We're talking about nonsense, hurricanes, whatever. That is like the complimentary bread and butter. You sit down at the restaurant. It's the year 2004, and you're getting complimentary bread and butter because God knows when you go to a restaurant now, they don't have complimentary bread and butter, but you can get an $18 cocktail and a $23 charcuterie board if you're a fucking idiot. Um, no, this is this is the appetizer section. Okay, guys, you ready for your fucking escargot? You ready for your spinach dip? Let's get in. Halo Infinite is getting a third-person mode next month. The news was announced during the 2024 Halo World Championship in Seattle this past weekend. That's why we're going to get a lot more Halo news in a minute here. So it was revealed that the game will be receiving an update in November, which adds the ability to play the game from an over-the-shoulder viewpoint, kind of like, a, I don't know, Fortnite, uh, for the first for the Halo series. Third-person controls will be supported at a mode level. Senior community manager John, I can never say his name right, John... Junsek, whatever the fuck, you, you know the guy. If you're a Halo guy, you see him on Twitter. Uh, he says, uh, this means players will be able to manually switch between first person, and third person, and it will be uh, set for them. So it's based on the mode you're playing. But while you're in Forge, you can fuck around and switch between first person, and third person. So that will be an option. Um, whatever. People are saying it's coming together well, it plays well, it cha kind of changes up the gameplay formula. No shit. I don't know. I don't have big feelings about this. I feel like everyone's kind of up in arms about it. Uh, do I think a third person mode is necessary for Halo? No, it's kind of antithetical to what the series has always been. It's a premiere. It is, in my opinion, the premier first person shooter franchise. Um, so there's something kind of, I guess, sacrilege about maybe doing a third person mode for Halo. But does that mean that we shouldn't have fun and maybe make it an option for those who want it and maybe just see how it goes? 
Uh, not really. I don't really, you know, I don't think this is like some, I don't think the, the first person perspective has to be like some sacred cow for the Halo franchise. If you want to dick around after four years of Halo Infinite and throw in a third person mode for the, for shits and giggles, I don't see why not. Um, I think there are plenty of great Halo games that could be made that would be third person shooters. Um, not that I'm saying I need the next main Master Chief game to be a third person shooter, but I don't know. I don't think third person and Halo can't mix, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's just, uh, it is a weird choice, right? There's something that feels odd about it, but you know, whatever. They added a third person mode to Modern Warfare 2 a few years ago, that that one Modern Warfare game that was surprisingly good. And um, I, I thought the third person mode in that game was awesome, actually. I used to play the third person mosh pit mode, multiplayer mode, um, in the early days of Modern Warfare 2 2022. And I, I thought they did a really good job. It felt, honestly, it felt better to play than like Uncharted, which is a third person over the shoulder well, you know, action adventure story driven game, but it has shooting in it. And I thought Modern Warfare, you know, I thought Infinity Ward did a great job with that third person shooter mode. So who knows? Maybe this will feel really fun to go back into Halo and try it out in third person again. I don't know. I, it, it, it does this matter. Not really. Do I think the next main Halo game, Halo Infinite 2, Return of Infinite Halo, uh, do I think that's going to be a third-person Halo game because this this is happening? No. It's just, dude, they're just looking for fun things to throw into the game. Um, although it does feel like a lot of work has to go into this, right? Because it, doesn't that kind of like break the game to have to... I don't, I don't know enough about games. I'm not going to get into that. But I'll, I'll definitely give this a try just for shits and giggles. I, I doubt it's going to be anything groundbreaking. I doubt this is going to make the Fortnite kids love Halo, but... There's no denying that, you know, third-person games are huge, and the biggest game in the world is a third-person, over-the-shoulder shooting game called Fortnite. And so if we can make Halo, I don't know, become a little more visually or control-wise appealing to uh, people who grew up loving Fortnite but don't necessarily have the 30-year-old affinity that we all have, you know, like the, the affinity that 30-year-old men have for Halo, then, you know, maybe it's a way to help get new people through the door, which is nothing but a good thing. So, Cool. For those who care, I don't know. I see a lot of people getting up in arms about this. I feel like maybe we should focus on, like, I don't know, the homeless pop, uh, population that we just refuse to address. I don't know. Doesn't, doesn't that seem, that's always my like, my scapegoat. It's like, oh, you're angry about the fact that Ben & Jerry's got rid of your favorite ice cream flavor? Maybe you should focus your anger on, like, the fact that the government's not helping homeless people. It's always, what a fucking easy scapegoat. What a, what a stupid way to win an argument. Oh, you're mad? Oh, you're mad about... You're mad about your favorite country singer getting me too for raping a little boy? Maybe you should uh maybe you should focus your anger rather than defending <laughs> country stars. I don't know what I'm saying. Oh god. Um all right. Ubisoft. So we didn't really touch on this last week, but whatever, we can we can get to it all now. I, I don't have much to say because I'm not a fucking corporate analyst. Uh, we got we got enough of that meandering about from the two and a half years of Microsoft trying to buy Activision, but there's some upheaval. There's some behind the scenes uh, happenings at Ubisoft. Things aren't great for them. They haven't had a tremendous past couple years. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's, it's been rough for them, but um, now with ultra like historically low uh, stock prices, we're getting some, some rumorings about maybe someone coming to buy them out, make them private. So there's talkings of Chinese conglomerate Tencent possibly talking to the Gilmont family, which owns Ubisoft, about maybe them taking over the company, taking it private, and Tencent owing, owning it. Uh, you know, this is what happens when Microsoft is allowed to buy Activision. You, you open the floodgates for a Tencent to buy a Ubisoft. It's just part of it's just part of the uh, the the fallout of that kind of decision making. Uh, but anyway, last week Bloomberg was the one who sourced it and wrote the story claiming that the Chinese conglomerate, which uh, is, is looking into, you know, having the conversations with the Gilmont family and possibly exploring buying them out. They already own a 10% stake in Ubisoft to begin with. Uh, but one of the possibilities discussed uh, would be taking the company private if Tencent buys them out. Um, the report caused Ubisoft share price to increase to nearly 40%, or increased by nearly 40%. So I think their stocks went from something like 10 or $11 dollars uh, like, and then shot up, um, which is crazy because their stocks used to be 
somewhere in like the 90 to $100 range. So Ubisoft stock is at an all-time low. But then again, they're trading on the European market, so I don't think that really means anything because, you know, they just trade with fucking cigarettes and bottles of wine and stuff like that. They don't really use, like, money or anything. Uh, but the report caused Ubisoft share price to increase by nearly 40%. We already said that, idiot. Uh, here's the quote. So a spokesperson on behalf of Ubisoft says, Ubisoft has noted recent press speculation regarding potential interest around the company. It regularly reviews all of its strategic options in the interest of, sh of stakeholders and will inform the markets if and when appropriate. The company reiterates that the management is currently focused on executing its strategies centered on two core verticals, open world adventures and games as a service narrative experiences. Uh, ooh. Um, so yeah, I mean, the listen, the fact that they had PR respond to it means, yeah, th these conversations are happening now. Shut the fuck up. We're talking because if nothing was happening, you could have said nothing uh, because nothing would have been happening. So what would, would be happening? Um, yeah. So this just confirms that, yeah, these conversations are happening behind closed doors. Does that mean something is going to come of this? Maybe, maybe not, but definitely something to keep your eyes on. So yeah, Ubisoft could be going privately owned by Tencent. That's so fucking cool. I love that. Um, Hey, in lighter news, I did see that um, the Saudi Wealth Fund or whatever uh, decreased their ownership of Nintendo from like eight to seven percent. So that's good. Um, that's one of my. That's not my favorite, but that's one of the funniest stories in like mass consolidation and, and CD investment in the games industry that's been going on the past few years. Because I love when that happened last year. Uh, Nintendo or was that two years ago? Nintendo was like. Uh, oh, yeah, we, we did not know <laughs> the Saudi Royal Fund was investing in our company. We literally didn't know, and now they own like 7 or 8% of our of our company. So that's funny. Um, it's sad. It's, 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 you know, you hope it doesn't happen. You hope that the, the piece of shit crown prince of Saudi Arabia who makes it illegal to be gay and beheads people uh, and, and makes women live as second-class citizens uh, doesn't own a controlling share in the company that brings you family experiences like the super mario brothers so uh cool life is so cool anyway we'll, we'll keep it we'll keep tabs on what happens with ubisoft nothing to say here i'm not a financial analyst i'm not a, a, a person with um, intelligence so what what do you want there's what's happening we'll see how it goes it seems like ubisoft is always somewhat in like a precarious situation as far as like ownership or takeovers because you remember, like, and I know we talked about it on the podcast not too long ago, but roughly 10 years ago, there was that story where Vivendi was trying to do a hostile takeover of Ubisoft by buying up shares. And they were, like, talking about it, and it was, like, a public thing everyone knew about. And then that, they, you know, they kind of backed off in the last minute there. But this seems to be, like, a reoccurring thing for Ubisoft, where it's, like, when they hit a low, someone's like, hey, let me take these fucking Frenchmen over. And then they realize, oh, why, why would I benefit from having... Uh, Assassin's Creed. Uh, that's stupid. I should just go buy Call of Duty instead, and then, and then you know the cycle resets. I guess I like Ubisoft. I always, I always have to like reemphasize that. I really, I really do like Ubisoft. I appreciate that. I think they're historically a strong player in the game space. Like even if you don't love what Ubisoft has done the past five years or whatever, it's like they are historically a big part of the conversation, right? They've been around forever. We all grew up on on Ubisoft, and it's like I just feel like. I don't know. Wouldn't you like to see Ubisoft come out ahead, turn the ship around, and get back on track rather than rooting for their demise? I, I don't know. I'm I'm a Ubisoft fan, so I don't I don't wish for ten cent to gobble them up. I wish they would just kind of get their shit together and put out some better games. Um, but that's about it. All right, that's gonna do it for our opening news stories this week. You guys, we're gonna get into the games I've been playing because I want to talk about. Starfield Shattered Space. Uh, but before I tell you about what I've been playing, first, let me tell you all about what I've been eating. And I am so very excited to tell you guys about what I've been eating because Saturday night, I had the extraordinary opportunity to dine at a Sonic drive through for the first time in, I'm ashamed to say it, probably for the first time in six to 12 months, somewhere like that. It's been a while. It's been a long minute since I've, since I've had Sonic. And... I always I always make the distinction. I am not a fan of Sonic the drive through fast food restaurant because I love Sonic the Hedgehog. That is purely coincidence. I just, I don't know. Cars, fast, fast food, blue cars, red cars like Lightning McQueen, blue hedgehogs, the speed aspect, the car aspect. These are all purely coincidental. Do not draw out the Venn diagram of my love of cars, Hot Wheels, Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic the Restaurant, and try to figure out where everything overlaps, because I'm sure there's something that exists, but I'm not psychologically ready to handle that reality of, of why I love all these things, um, so please don't look further into it, but 
I do love Sonic, uh, the restaurant, so very much. It is, in my opinion, I don't, well, I don't know if I would say the most underrated fast food restaurant because all the best fast food restaurants are so underrated. Listen, I'm a normal guy. I love McDonald's. I get that they're the biggest. I'm a fan of McDonald's. I'm a fan of Starbucks. Um, the fact that Subway at one point was one of the most popular fast food restaurants makes me wish that all the nuclear bombs went out because humanity does not deserve to exist if you motherfuckers are financially supporting Subway. Subway is disgusting. And I say this as someone who will eat just about anything. Subway is absolutely abhorrent, bottom of the barrel, subhuman food. Fuck Subway. All right, now that we got that out of the way. Subway's worse than ketchup. I'd rather eat ketchup on a cheeseburger than eat at Subway. That's how fucking much I hate Subway. But anyway, there are so many underappreciated fast food restaurants. Popeye's famously one of the most underappreciated fast food restaurants. They got a lot a lot of attention in recent years with that really good chicken sandwich they put out. But especially before that, Popeye's, dude, their chicken's so fucking good. The Blackened Ranch, so fucking good. People just don't appreciate Popeye's enough, and that makes me sad. Taco Bell, it's popular. It's well-known. But I feel like it has a, it has this reputation where everyone has to shit on it. Don't shit on Taco Bell. Taco Bell's good. Be, stop being an asshole. But Sonic is like that one fast food restaurant where I'm like, I kind of feel this way about Dairy Queen as well, but especially Sonic, where it's like, their food is genuinely good. Like, they have great food, actually. They have great ice cream. They have fun drinks. They always got fun new things going on in their menu. Sonic is a great restaurant all around. Now, I, I won't I won't deny, I don't love the experience of pulling up, hitting the drive, the, the little, you know, they have like the little parking spaces with the menu board and they bring the food out to you. I wish you could go inside the Sonic. And there are some locations that do offer that. I found one. Last time I went to Sonic, we have one in, in Lakeland, Florida, of all places. But um, but I, I get it. For the most part, I'm not crazy about the setup of Sonic. And I know that most of them are all old and dilapidated and kind of shitty. And the service is, like, slow and bad. And they, they have some work to do to, to, to get things up to par. But uh, side note, when I was in Kansas City the other week, so many Sonic everywhere. So many Sonic drive throughs And they were all, like, brand new and clean. It's so weird. I've never seen that. But, um... You know, growing up in the South, Sonic is like, they're few and far between. They're all run down. But anyway, long story short, went to Sonic and it's been, it's been a while. I know there's a lot of things that have changed on their menu. We went there because they have this new Halloween drink where it's like a float drink. So it's like vanilla ice cream, but instead of root beer, it's like a green apple slushy. So it's green apple slushy and then vanilla ice cream. And then what else? It was, I don't know if it had whipped cream or not, but it has these like little, tapioca popping pearls but they're like salted caramel so it's like green apple caramel kind of flavor which is a fun like halloween candy apple treat but then you get it with the vanilla ice cream as like a kind of root beer float alternative and i had no expectations for this thing i thought it was going to be like super gimmicky but the thing is like the people i was with like they they wanted they wanted to try it my girlfriend really wanted to try it so i was like okay if that's if if that is a way to get everyone to want to go to sonic fuck yeah let's go to sonic so we get the drink Drink's actually way better than I thought it'd be, but I don't want to talk about that because I don't care about that. That's a limited time thing. It's here. It's gone. I don't care. Sonic recently changed from regular French fries to crinkle cut fries, which is very controversial, and I've been meaning to try this out because crinkle fries are okay. You know, waffle fries are okay. I hate steak cut fries. I hate, like, wedge fries. I like my fries straight, crispy, classic, like McDonald's fries. Like, that's, that's the ideal French fry. And Sonic had good French fries, so I don't know why the fuck they felt the need to change them, but they did, and they call them groovy fries because they hate me and they want to make me say silly things on the podcast, so they call them groovy fries, and I, I need to try them out. On top of that, they also recently introduced a smash burger because smash burgers are uh, an old thing that has randomly blown up in popularity, which I'm not complaining about because I love smash burgers, so they have a smash burger on the menu, they got new crinkle cut fries, and then they also got this new blue drink where it's like half blue raspberry ice icy and then like half vanilla ice cream but it's all blended together so it's like a creamy blue raspberry soft serve slushy thing and it's like 2 bucks and fucking phenomenal the drink the blue slushy creamy dream whatever they call a drink amazing the crinkle cut french fries Way better than I thought they'd be. Still perfect amount of crispy. Ours were a little overly salted, but I'd rather them be overly salty than undersalted. So those were fucking awesome. And then the Smash Burger. I don't really know that you can technically call it a Smash Burger because the patty, patties were not smashed at all. They were like standard fast food patties. Um, but that aside, the sauce they put on there, awesome. The bun, awesome. The burger, fucking great. Really, really good fast food cheeseburger. Is it a great Smash Burger? No. Is it a great drive through fast food cheeseburger? Fuck yeah. Dude, shout out to Sonic. I had 
no expectation that the fries would be good. I didn't care about the Halloween drink. I wasn't there for any of that. I just wanted to go to Sonic. Tried a, a litany of new menu items, and everything was phenomenal. And it's just like, what the fuck, man? It's it's that thing, man, where it's just like, you know, Sonic Generations comes out in 2010, 2011. Gets good reviews, but eh, whatever. It's, it's no Mario. Mario comes out with a Galaxy game or a fucking Odyssey game. The world blows up. Come on, guys. It's the same thing in the fast food sp- space. Like, why Why can we not appreciate good... Th- Sonic drive Through? they're out here putting out good menu items, and y'all just care about your fucking hip-hop artists of the week fucking marketing whatever menu. You know, the Krabby Patty menu, the fucking little... I don't know. <laughs> I almost said a little Bow Wow, who hasn't been a popular musician, I, th- I think, in maybe 20 years. <laughs> 22 years uh i don't remember which artist (laughs) did the thing i think the one i'm thinking of is the the k-pop one they did at mcdonald's um what what the fuck am i thinking of fucking boy the k-pop band that everyone loves the the group something what what is wrong with me something b something with a b in it i don't know why i'm blanking anyway it doesn't fucking matter uh god the sabrina carpenter a fucking Chipotle combo. You know what I'm talking about. The celebrity tie-in thing. I think Taco Bell's doing one with some like um, some popular Mexican uh, music artist uh, over a hot sauce packet they have. Um, so it's like, I don't know. It's a, it's a whole thing. But like you guys are flipping your shit. McDonald's got the fucking Wendy's Krabby Patty. What about Sonic, guys? What about Sonic? Smash Burger, Groovy Fries, Creamy Blue Raspberry Drink, Fun Halloween Menu Items, this is a wonderful brand, and I need you to stop what you're doing and eat more Sonic. Take care of your bodies, you know, be healthy, be well, but also eat more eat more Sonic. All right, how many times is Jesse going to say that that word in a day? All right, let's move on. That's it for what I've been eating. It was a wonderful meal. I loved it so much that I was like, is there a way I could somehow coerce my girlfriend into going to Sonic maybe another time in the next day or two? And that did not happen, but it would have been nice, right? Let's move on to the games I've been playing. So Marvel Midnight Suns, we'll put it on ice for a minute because I got to get to Starfield, right? I'm going to come right back to it. I'm still thinking about it. I'm still liking it. I want to play it. Hockey just started. I'm very excited to play Midnight Suns on the Logitech G Cloud while I watch hockey on the TV. It's going to be a very perfect companion game for, you know, we got the World Series. October is fucking crazy, man. Peak Haunted House season. Peak Halloween season. Peak movie release season right now. I guess that's technically summer, but for me this year, all the movies I want to see are coming out around now. Uh peak video game releases and all the big video games are starting to come out and then on top of that hockey's coming back baseball's wrapping up there's just too much entertainment not enough free time what the fuck's going on here what am i supposed to do so looking forward to getting back to midnight suns but had to put everything on ice so we could play starfield shattered space i love starfield if you've been listening to the podcast for at least a year you know uh starfield came out last year I just loved it. I, I I don't have tons of experience with Bethesda games. I've played Fallout 3 and 4. I've played um, Skyrim. So I, 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 I know enough. You know, I've played through these games, played through the campaigns and the main quest lines, whatever. But not a huge Bethesda Game Studios fan historically. But Starfield was definitely their game that most resonated with me, which is no surprise. I'm a huge sci-fi space, gen- especially like generic space guy. Like, like the less like specific it is, the less like, uh, like Star Trek, Star Wars it is, and the more like general, like just sci- science-y, sci-fi stuff it is, like spaceships, planet exploration, stuff like that. Like I fucking go nuts for that stuff. So Starfield was an obvious like match made in heaven for me. I, I love it. Plus, you know, I'll still say, especially coming back to it now, I cannot believe how good that game feels to play. Like it, it really does feel like, you know, it doesn't feel as good as Destiny, but it feels like, if Bethesda made a game like Destiny in terms of combat and, you know, just shooting and moment to moment, like combat or gameplay, I guess. I don't know. It, it still surprised me. Obviously, it's very like jaggedy and janky uh, relative to Destiny, but it's very smooth and buttery and, and satisfying to play for a Bethesda game. And so I, I really I really dig this game. It just really did it for me. I love Andresia. I love the main quest line. I love the world building. I just think this game was really, really great. So needless to say, Shattered Space, I was instantly bought in. I liked the eerie kind of like, I don't know what you want to say, like not spiritual, but like, yeah, there's something, there's something like kind of haunted and creepy about this expansion. They're kind of going for more of like a, like an alien, um, not Mass Effect, but uh, Dead Space kind of like horror, like space horror kind of vibe with it, which I think sounds super cool. And the trailers look super cool. And like the new 
palette and art style they were doing for this new planet and this new space station you're on. Everything just looked really good. Like, it was really my thing. Uh, but then I hop in. I do some research. How long is this quest line? How much of my life am I dedicating to it? It only It's only like a six or seven hour uh, quest line, really. And so I probably played about half of it this week. I, I was very busy with other things this weekend. I did a lot of deep house cleaning and things like that. So um, didn't play as much of it as I wanted to, but probably played three three hours of it or so. And my takeaway is it's definitely more Starfield. Like it visually looks like a new place, new environment, all that. But in terms of its gameplay, it's it's new. It's just more Starfield. And it's not like peak Starfield. I feel like it's kind of... It just kind of feels like another, like, quest line, like another, like, one of the factions, you know? Um, like, you do, like, Ryujin Industries or, like, the... I'm starting to forget all of them, you know, all the different factions in the game. But it just feels like a different faction storyline. This time it's House Varun, which happens to be the background where Andresia comes from. So, of course, you know, for me, I'm very invested in learning more about her background, her people, her her world, and helping, helping them in, in their quest to do whatever they need because... I want to look good for her, of course. I want her to love me. Um, so, I don't know. I, I kind of came in, like, expecting it to be a bigger, like, more, like, sequel-type story. But it ends up just kind of being, like, another faction's quest line. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially considering I paid the $30 upgrade when the game came out. So, I could play the game five days early on Game Pass. And getting access to this expansion as a result of that was just kind of icing on top. So I was I don't really feel like financially burned or anything by investing in this, but I also don't feel like this is really a thirty dollar big bad expansion that's like, whoa, this is guys, hop back into Starfield right away. This is it. I feel like if you liked Starfield like I did, yeah, you want to come back and play this. It's it's more good Starfield. But if you were not sold on Starfield last year, you don't have any reason to be here because this is not going to change your mind. Um, it is a little slower paced, a little, I yeah, maybe a little boring. You know, we'll see how it picks up in the second half. I'm only like halfway through this quest line, so I'm sure it'll get a lot more interesting towards the end. But am I glad I'm playing it? Am I, am I having a good time? Yeah. But am I like, I don't know, am I being like pulled back into the world of Starfield to the point where I'm like, I, I need to take another 50 to 100 hours to play more of this game. I love this game so much. Not really. I feel like I'll probably finish this up do a couple other things and then bounce after 10 total hours of Starfield, uh, additional hours of Starfield. And then, and then be like, yeah, I played shattered space. It was fine. You know? Um, yeah. My, my reaction is it's kind of like, it's, it's just kind of okay. It's not great. It's not bad at all. Um, but it's just some more Starfield for those who enjoyed it. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, for anytime it's like one of your favorite games and you're just getting more of it, there's really nothing to complain about, but I did I did kind of hope that there was going to be, I don't know, I guess bigger action or bigger stakes with the with a story or just kind of something a little more intense going on. Um, I definitely think the way it starts out is really cool. It's like you just just fly out into orbit anywhere where you don't have a main quest objective, and then you'll just come across this like abandoned space station, and then you just dock it, and there's like this transmission. It's like please do not dock, please go away. It's like telling you not to come it's like a distress signal and you just dock at the space station anyway and then you go in there and it's all like fucking creepy creepy and haunted and there's these like spiritual figures and stuff that are just like attacking you and shit it's it's cool it's it's like a proper halloween game it's like it, it came out at a great time of year honestly um but it's just overall like once you really get into the meat and potatoes of the of, of the dlc it's it's just it's just another it's just another factions quest line um but yeah, that's kind of my take on it. We'll see if it changes after I finish it up this week. Hopefully, please, for love of fucking Christ. Like, the only the only true thing with this hurricane I'm dreading, it's like, please. I know we're going to lose power. I know it's going to happen. But, like, please, don't don't let us lose power for more than, like, a day or two. Please, for love of fucking Christ. Um, I know there are some people who are, like, <laughs> about to lose their fucking homes. And so that's the bigger concern. You know, the people out on the coast. But for the more sheltered and privileged people like me who are here more inland, I'm just like, please don't let me lose power so I can you know, continue to take showers and, and, and play video games and watch hockey this weekend. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the hope. That's the plan is to wrap up shattered space. Um, and then hop back into Marvel midnight suns. Cause that's what I'm really loving. And then maybe I'll go play that shitty, uh, transformers game. Uh, but that's it for what I've been playing. We do have a couple, actually, I'm sorry. We have a couple comments, a couple write-ins about Starfield. I want to read those now. Cargo runner nine, nine, six, zero. You know, to a dyslexic person, it looks like your name is Cargo Runner 69. Anyway, Cargo Runner writes in and says, The Shattered Space trailer 
is great. The interviews with Todd Howard, etc., made Shattered Space sound really good as they were going back to the handcrafted world. The House of Varun had a huge amount of potential. But for me, they just did not deliver what I expected in the uh sorry, they they have just not delivered except in the art design department. Getting away from the NASA art, at least partially, really makes the visuals more interesting. Definitely some good-looking original visuals in the DLC. One of the main choices and endings for the DLC is just a white screen, no message, no epilogue, no nothing. Spoiler alert, brother. Uh, I was really just confused and didn't even realize it was game over for a while. I would give it a deal. I would give the DLC a six out of ten. The same score I would give the main game. I think that's pretty fair. <clears throat> Again, I haven't finished it, so I can't speak to it. But yeah, I mean. Listen, I, I understand Starfield is a game that underwhelmed a lot of people. There is something I'm clearly not getting um, as someone who doesn't have the affinity for Fallout and Elder Scrolls that a lot of other people have, where I'm not able to really understand and identify why people click with those franchises, but not with Starfield. Because for me, Starfield really does work. Um, but again, it's it, it just goes back to like kind of like my, my main overview point. If you like Starfield, it's more of that. Good for you. And if you thought Starfield was bad or you know just okay then you're probably not going to have your opinion changed by this DLC. And it looks like Cargo Runner, you're kind of an example of what I'm talking about. You know, you thought 6 out of 10, that's like an okay game, you know? That's like, so, you know, good, not great kind of thing. So, sounds like the DLC made you feel the same way that the, the main game made you feel. So, it is too bad that this game, this DLC wasn't able to come out and change everyone's opinion and make everyone love the game. Oh, although I will say one thing. This is the first time I played Starfield since that 60 FPS update came out. I played like the first 45 minutes of, of Shattered Space still at 30 FPS. And then I went, what, what, what the fuck? Didn't they, didn't they update this game? 60 FPS now. So I go in the options and I toggle it to 60 FPS. And then I change the uh, visual setting to, perf to, uh, to favor performance over visuals. And then I, I must say, yeah, the visuals take a slight hit. Almost unnoticeable for me. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, but oh my god, playing Starfield in 60 FPS over 30 FPS, I didn't have an issue with the 30 FPS when I was playing it last year. I thought it was, you know, it wasn't ideal, but it wasn't bad either. But oh my god, the second you turn it on to 60 FPS, you can never go back. It feels so much better. Oh my god, this game is such a huge upgrade. If you haven't played Starfield and now you're going to jump into it for the first time, dude, switch that six, switch that thing to 60 FPS. You're in for a treat. It is. It, it feels so good. I've never, you know, I played Fallout 3, Fallout 76, Fallout 4, Elder Scrolls, um, uh, Skyrim. I've watched my brothers play countless hours of Oblivion and Morrowind back in the day. I have never seen or felt a, a Bethesda game that has just looked and felt at half as good as this feels. It's just, oh my God, 60 FPS Starfield makes me tingly in places it shouldn't. But anyway, uh, Headhunting Halo, who we always reserve for the very end of the podcast, Writes in about Starfield, so we'll put it here because it makes more sense, but our boy Headhunting Halo writes in, completed Shattered Space DLC, and honestly, it was pretty boring. Was hoping for new ships to own uh, at a dealer, but sadly couldn't find any. Breaking, um, and then you said, <laughs> classic Headhunting Halo. Breaking news, future Halo games are in the works of Unreal Engine and getting Slip Space Engine. Also, 343 changed their name to Halo Studios and said 343 has R for Halo, and let's do better multiplayer. We'll get, we'll get there. Hold on, Headhunting Halo. Don't get ahead of us. Also, bought tickets for Terrifier 3. Get pumped. I don't know what the fuck that is. I'm assuming it's a movie. Good for you, Headhunting Halo. But yeah, it looks more of the same, right? Completed it. Pretty boring. Was hoping for new stuff. Eh. So it does seem like that is the overall takeaway. And I've seen most of the reception has been pretty much like, eh, I'm disappointed. So, yeah. Not, not much more to say on that. We'll bring it back up next week when I finish the DLC. Uh, but until then... I'm enjoying it just fine. I'm not blown away by it. I do agree it's a little boring, but um, I love Starfield, so I'll take more of it, whatever. Hopefully hopefully they do another expansion and really turn around. I did see that quote. I don't remember who said it, but someone at, someone at Bethesda said, um, what, what we've learned from working on Starfield is that our audience really wants Elder Scrolls VI. And it's it's so funny, like that headline, that's so funny, but it's also really sad. It, it, makes, me, it makes me sad that like creatives are so fucking pigeon held to their past successes they're so like they're so like imprisoned to their past successes that's like the world the world will just always remember you for that other thing you did if they don't love the new thing you're doing and it's like 
I get that. Like you're entitled as a, as a consumer, as a fan to be like, I really liked this first thing you did. And then I really think you lost your way with everything afterwards that you're, you're welcome to feel that way. But also I do hate that for creatives. It's like they, people just kind of get pigeon held into trying to service people with more of what they think you liked and not doing what it is they want to do. But let's hold that thought because I think we're about to get into that conversation when we talk about halo in just a minute here. So that's it for what I've been playing. Take a quick water break. Get back into the news, and we'll talk all things Halo. All right, let's jump in and talk some Halo. So, this weekend, the Halo Championship whatever thing happened, the annual eSports Halo thing. And so the last night, we got that little snippet that we already talked about with the third-person mode coming to Halo Infinite, fun little thing. But then the big news that we got was this whole write-up. Um, Xbox Wire did a whole write-up that, that we're, you know, I parsed through, trimmed some of the fat out, and we're going to go through. Um, but basically, big bombshell news, Halo switching to Unreal Engine. You know, we've been, this this has been a rumored story, uh, so we we know they've been talking about this at 343 for years now. Um, the, the original rumor uh, a couple years back, two years back, was that they were going to port Halo Infinite from Slipspace Engine, which is their proprietary engine, over to Unreal Engine. Um, so they can make development a little easier. Um, and that, I think that was a Windows Central reporting, actually, Jez Corden reporting, if I'm not mistaken, from 2022. And I'm sure that was the talking, uh, the, the talk back then and, and the plan back then. But I think they moved away from that as it became more and more apparent that Halo Infinite, it's not, you know, it was a success. It got good reviews and got a large player count at launch and made money. But um, it wasn't the live service mega hit that they wanted it to be. The game fell apart after a couple months and didn't really have legs because they had no live service uh, content model or uh, stream for it that they could really follow through on. So anyway, long story short, we don't have to get into the woes of Halo Infinite really, but um, so yeah, just, just for context, know that this is something that has been rumored for a long time. We've kind of been expecting it. And the big reason behind the switch to a new engine type is because, you know, 343, just like Bungie before them, we're always juggling two parts of Halo development. One half is making Halo video games, and one half is working on your own proprietary engine to make Halo games and tinkering with it and upgrading it and fucking around with it, which is cool. And there was that was a pretty common thing in the early 2000s. A lot of companies use their own proprietary engines, um, you know, or they just use Unreal Engine 3 or whatever. Um, but the... Um, the world has changed a lot. Game development is very finicky. Um, it's very cumbersome. It takes a long time to put out a video game. And more and more these days, it's just appealing to have the well-supported, highly sophisticated, well-understood, um, accessible tools that come with like an Unreal Engine um, or whatever. And that's why most games do use one of the big one of the big engines um, to make their games. And so, you know, wh when you look at a team like 343 and how it's undergone such massive leadership changes and more to the point, the entire staff overall has turned over a million times, you know, since Halo 4 came out. We're left with a, with a team that is a shell of a shell of a shell of its former self. They're largely gutted. And now in order to pick up the pieces and move forward and do the next iteration of Halo, you basically have to rebuild the team. They got some core people but they, they need a team and they're going to run into the same cycle that they ran into with Halo Infinite. If they try to stick with their proprietary engine that takes learning and that is hard to pick up on um, rather than saying, Hey, here's an engine that most game developers are already familiar with that it's easy to work in. And we don't have to do the legwork of creating the engine and maintain the engine ourselves. So let's just adopt this other engine, get over our history, get over our, our pride adopt this other mainstream engine. And then when we hire people for this team to work on these Halo games, they will already be familiar with Unreal Engine because it's kind of an industry standard. So that's kind of the logic behind the decision. And uh, yeah, right now 343 is obviously in a, in a phase of we need to hire back up. Hey, come and work for us. There's a lot of companies that do this. Like you see it all the time when the uh, the producer of this game and the writer, the the lead writer of that game, um, have left this studio and now they're forming a new team called Make People Smile and they're working on a action RPG video game with graphics and characters. It's like okay, so a lot of nonsense, a lot of no nothing. And the reason why these these stories come out so consistently is because they're basically saying, hey. 
we're forming a team and we need people to come work here. Please send us your resume. Come to LinkedIn, please, for the love of Christ. We need people. So that's that's really what we're what we're seeing. And and at the at the soul and at the heart of what this all this news is, this is more than anything uh, an advertisement to people in the industry to say, hey, Halo is ramping up to lean into its next phase of whatever it's going to be. We need people to come work here. Look at what we're doing. Send it. Send us your resume. So, with all that context in place, now we can get into the story. So, this is directly from Xbox Wire. Like I said, I've trimmed a lot of the fat around it, but it's still going to be a lengthy write-up. This is going to be the big news. This is what we're here to talk about. So, let's go through it. Take our time. And, uh, it, dude, it's been a while since we've really talked Halo on this podcast. So, I'm actually kind of excited because, you know, there, there was a day <laughs> where so much of what we talked about on the Xbox podcast was Halo because Halo is like the core franchise of the brand. And also because in the early days of Xbox on, we were all hotly anticipating Halo Infinite. But, it's, it, dude, it's been, it's been weird. The past couple of years, Halo's been really quiet. And what we've been talking about is, I don't know, like, I don't know fucking Activision. <laughs> so, it's just Bethesda, all these brands that up until like 72 months ago weren't xbox uh it's uh it's just weird world we're living in but let's get back to basics let's talk some halo so here we go and we'll, we'll just kind of stop in between parts and, and, and discuss as we go along all right ahead of the final match of last week's 2024 halo world championship we saw an unexpected video we're entering and if the perspective of, of the of the write-up sounds weird just remember this is xbox wire so it's a lot of pr writing um i tried to again trim some fat out so we'll, we'll try to keep it concise we're entering a new dawn for Halo. Those new visuals, uh, those new visuals that we created, and so, oh, sorry, further context, they released a video, and they released a bunch of screenshots. So they have mocked up, and we'll get into it, uh, these different environments in Unreal Engine 5 that imitate, you know, like a Halo ring, or like a flood, over, like an overcome flood installation, or like a, um, like a tundra type environment, like a snowy environment, whatever, to, to fuck around and show the potential of what they could build um, as far as like Halo content in Unreal Engine 5. So they released these screenshots and they released uh, this video that overviews it. And we'll get to that in a minute. But so they say these new visuals were created using Unreal Engine 5. And we're learning all about the future of Halo projects that will use the engine and the multiplayer uh, and the multiple new games that are in development alongside the new engine changes. Here's the other big part that I haven't touched on. The studio is seeing changes in culture, workflow, and how its team is organized. To match this new approach, the fr the franchise stewards, 343 Industries, are changing their name to Halo Studios. All right. So, studio head Pierre Heinz uh, defines the um, this change as less of a clean break and more of a turning of the page, saying, if you really break Halo down, there have been two very distinctive chapters. Chapter 1, Bungie. Chapter 2, 343 Industries. Now I think we have an audience which is hungry for more. So we're not just going to try and improve the efficiency of development, but change the recipe of how we make Halo games. So we start a new chapter today. So chapter three, Halo Studios. All right, let, let's just stop right there before we get into some meat and potatoes here. Obviously, this is very PR focused. Um, this is trying to control your messaging. Obviously, Halo is in a low point. Um, before this, it was in a low point, and before that, it was in a middle of the road point, right? Halo, Bungie left the franchise on a high note. 343 forms, they make Halo 4, it's in like a medium note, where it's like the game reviewed well, the game sold well, people generally liked it, but the longer we get removed from Halo 4, the more people go, you know, that was kind of weird for a Halo game. Then Halo 5 comes out, and people go... Yeah, we don't like these guys. I don't like what they're doing with Halo. Then Halo Infinite g comes out, and it's like, yeah, you're trying to get back to the, what we want, but also you're kind of bastardizing the thing you were creating, but also this is, like, not really what we want. It looks like what we want, but it's not what we want. What's going on here? And now it's like, okay, things have gotten so messy, and then the internal political upheaval uh, behind the scenes at 343, and Bonnie Ross is gone, and now everyone's gone, and now we got to hire new people, and we were doing contract workers, we didn't have real employees, the Slip Space Engine is a nightmare to work with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly Halo is in bad hands, and the the the, the chatter forever, including people who used to work on Halo um, back in the Bungie days, is that 343 have not managed the franchise very well, Microsoft have not managed the franchise very well, uh, Halo is not looking hot. You know, they, they've, they've really fumbled the ball with this once top tier pillar IP, this thing that used to be an industry defining, you know, mo like just absolute monolith. 
um, has fallen from grace. And now it's, you know, just like a middle of the road, big franchise, no doubt, but it's not what it once was. It doesn't inspire and in, 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 in define the industry the way the Halo franchise once did. And if there's anything I can really agree with from any of those perspectives I'm introducing, it is that one. It is definitely that Halo is not the big contender that it once was. I, oh, you know, people who listen to the podcast for a long time, you know me. I love Halo 4. I love Halo 5. I really was open to and accepting of the massive changes aesthetically, gameplay-wise, narratively, that 343 were making with Halo, with their version of Halo, with 4, 5, and so on, with that Forerunner saga that they abandoned after 5. Um, I was a huge fan of Halo. So, loved Bungie, loved 343. My gripe with Halo really gets introduced with Infinite, where they start just stabbing themselves in the back, and we can get into that in a minute, but um, I think it's kind of like Star Wars, and I, I hate to always bring Star Wars up when I talk about Halo, but, you know, George Lucas comes in. There's this trilogy. Everyone loves Star Wars 1, 2, and 3, or whatever, 4, 5, and 6, whatever we call them, right? Then years later, it's like, yeah, let's do more, right? And then the prequels happen. And the original fans go, that's not Star Wars. And that's like 343 making like Halo 4 and 5, right? That's not Halo. You fucked up. That's not Halo. We don't like that. And then Halo Infinite is like Disney coming in and being like, here's 8,000 TV shows for Disney Plus and a new trilogy of movies that we have no plan for that we're going to fucking screw up in the last act, you know? And Halo Infinite's like, all right, well, now you pissed off the original fans that were already pissed off. And you've pissed off the new fans that liked the 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 middle trilogy, and now you just pissed everyone off. And that's that's kind of where we are with Halo. Halo Infinite to me is like Disney Star Wars. It's like now the old fans hate you, the new fans hate you, and everyone's just kind of fucking fed up, you know. Even if you're doing some good things, because there are some good Disney Star Wars movies. I like a couple of a couple of the movies, and uh, at least one of the Disney Plus shows, right? Like you can't broken clocks right twice a day kind of thing. That's the same thing with Halo Infinite. It's like, yeah, the game feels great to play. There are some great moments. The grapple hook is phenomenal. Um, there are some great ideas in the story, even though you totally fucking abandoned Halo 5, which sucks. Um, you know, whatever. But, like, I can't overlook the fact that you fucked up so many things. And so all of this just to say, Halo is a shell of its former self. Everyone's pissed off about Halo. This is 100% a decision made to do a clean break from all the fucking up of the franchise you've done over the years and to say, we need to hit the hard reset button. We already know that you guys did that a few years ago by gutting out the entire leadership at 343 and by having everyone else basically be like, fuck you guys, I'm out of here. So this is, like, make no mistake, I'm not making a judgment on the studio head, this Pierre Heinz guy that I don't know anything about. Uh, I just know he's been here for like two years as the, as the studio head since Bonnie Ross left. Um, no judgment on him as a person, but 100%. This is, like, he says, this is not a clean break. This is the turning of a page. No, this is a clean break. <laughs> this is 100% a clean break. This is, we fucked up. We pissed everyone off with Halo 4 and 5, the old fans. And then we pissed off everyone else with Halo Infinite. We need a clean break. We need to get our shit together. We can't be relying on contract work as much. We need a core team that has a unified vision. We need to get back to basics. We need to figure out what we're doing, and we need to streamline the process. And abandoning slip space, ab abandoning your proprietary engine, and going for something like Unreal Engine is about streamlining the process. All right, so let's get back in. They say they, they title this The First Steps. Switching from Studio's proprietary Slipspace engine to Unreal Engine is a key part of the change. Previously, 343 needed a large portion of its staff simply to develop and upkeep the engine that the games ran on. We believe that the consumption habits of gamers have changed. The expectations of how fast they want their content available, says Heinz. Um, and I'm probably saying his name wrong. It's H-I-N-T-Z-E. Heinz? Heinz? -E? I'm going to say Heinz. On Halo Infinite, we were developing a tech stack that was supposed to set up for the future and uh, for, and games at the same time. As gaming evolves, the player and players increasingly point out how long it takes for new games to come out. Um, the Halo team, at Halo Studios, felt that they need to react. So COO Elizabeth Van Wyke puts it like this. The way we uh, made Halo games before doesn't necessarily work as well with the way people want us to make games in the future. So part of the conversation we had about how we want to help the team focus on making games versus making tools and engines. Adopting Unreal means that Halo Studios is more able to create games with the focus they can satisfy their fans with, even setting up multiple teams to create different games simultaneously. But Unreal also comes with built-in benefits that would have taken years to replicate with Slipspace Engine, like the following... Um, she says, quote, 
Respectfully, some components of Slipspace were almost 25 years old, explaining because that's because Slipspace was a new engine built on the bones of en- Bungie's engine from all the way back in the early 2000s. Um, I'm sorry, this is studio art director Chris Matthews talking about Slipspace. He says, Although 343 were developing it continuously, there are aspects of that of of Unreal and Epic um, that Epic. Sorry, there are. <laughs> let me restart. There are aspects of Unreal Engine that Epic, the owner of Unreal, um, have been developing for some time, which are unavailable to us in Slipspace, and would have taken a huge amount of time and resources to try out and replicate. One of our primary things uh, we're interested in is growing and expanding our world, so players have more to interact with and more to experience. Nanite and Lumen, which are Unreal Engine's rendering and lighting technologies, offer us an opportunity to do um, that in a way that has that the industry hasn't seen before. As artists, we're incredibly excited to do work. There's nothing inbuilt benefit. There's there's another inbuilt benefit. Unreal Engine. Um, is familiar to huge parts of the wider gaming industry where developers would have spent time learning how to use slip space when they joined 343 or halo studios uh, adopting this industry leading engine makes it smoother so we already talked about that right it's not just about how long it takes to bring a game to market but how long it takes to update the game bring the game with uh, new content for players adapt to what we're seeing with what players want um, part of this and how we build our games Uh, is how we build our games but another part is recruiting how long does it take to ramp someone up to be able to create assets to show in our game Um, with the move to unreal the on-ramp is much shorter the experience is there and the series can grow farther and quicker and more organically than ever before so again it's kind of what we talked about right you can see the behind the scenes out people we know what we want to do in halo but we're losing staff we need to hire more people these people don't know how to work in slip space it takes longer and harder to get everyone onboarded etc 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 you know if you work in one restaurant this is just my experience because I, i worked in restaurants forever right there are some of these POS systems, the computers where you put the orders in and send them to the kitchen and all that. If you work in one chain restaurant and they use one of the big name computer systems, when you quit your job and go to work at a different restaurant, you can pick up on the job a lot easier if they use that same computer program, right? But if everyone has their own proprietary computer program, now you're just making it harder for your new servers to learn how to, maybe this is a little too niche of an example, right? Uh, To learn how to memorize your menu and learn your restaurant because they're so busy learning this new computer system. So when they got to put in orders and run credit cards and check customers out, they got to memorize and learn this whole new system. It's like, it's like asking your whole team all right guys give us your iphones now you gotta switch to windows phones figure out how to do this shit yeah you can get the same thing done but everyone's already familiar with how to do it on this place so why make it harder for them just meet them where they're at and that's kind of what this is all about um so a little bit of maybe too much of a niche example but you get the idea nonetheless so clearly this is them saying uh halo infinite was plagued by people not understanding slip space and so we're trying to eliminate that that obstacle for our developers that's really what this is all right, so now they talk about forging ahead. This is this is the demos that they've built in Unreal Engine, which you can go see this video online. It looks great. You can see these, these screenshots. Like, graphically, there's no denying it looks great. They say, of course, Halo Studios uh, needed to be confident in the switch to Unreal. This isn't a decision taken lightly. Lightly, the team had to be sure that the first Halo game to come out of a non-slip space engine would look and feel and sound right. The team began experimenting, uh, and it resulted in the research project known as Project Foundry, the source for all new, all the new clips and screenshots that were announced. So what does the Foundry represent? The team is clear that it is not a new game, nor is it a traditional tech demo. It's just an exploration of what is possible using this new engine, uh, and it's a true reflection of what would uh, be required for a Halo game using Unreal Engine and training tool for how to get there. The Foundry has been made for the same rigor, process, and fidelity as a shipped game would be put out in so that they can know. They can test out the 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 engine and say, oh yeah, this is, okay, this is what it would look like if we built this kind of environment. This is how it would interact. This is how we recreate the things we've done before in Halo games, but with this kind of engine, this kind of technology. Foundry is designed to do what we haven't seen in games, or yeah, haven't seen in games using Unreal Engine across the industry. Halo began its life as a graphical showcase for the original Xbox. Our goal here is to make that so again. Halo Studios has worked closely with Unreal's creator, Epic Games, to ensure that they can reach that lofty goal. Of course, the soul of Halo isn't just how it looks, but also how it feels. The intrinsic the intrinsic dance of the combat, the thud of the weapons, and the sense that you're inhabiting the Master Chief's armor. While Foundry may be a, uh, primarily a visual project, Halo Studios is deeply invested in retaining the essence of what players love about Halo. Um, just 
kind of sounds funny when we're also in the same podcast talking about how they're adding a third person mode to Halo Infinite, but that's a side point. So let's just jump right into that next point real quick. So they say beyond the visor. Let's talk about what's coming beyond Foundry. As you might expect, the team isn't talking about um, exactly those what those new games will be right now. We're at the beginning of this new chapter, not the final stage. And there's it's fair to say that a new Halo game is not imminent. Halo Infinite will still be supported through Slipspace Engine. You can expect more operations, more updates to Forge Mode. In esports, yes, there will be a year four of Halo Championship Series using Halo Infinite. Uh, it's just announced and... But in the background, the next steps for Halo will be taken. The quietness is by design, uh, studio head Heinz says. He makes it clear that the priority right now is doing the work, not simply talking about it. He says, one of the things I really wanted to get away from was this continued teasing of the next game or the the possibilities of the must-haves. We should do more and say less. Uh, Yes, you should. For me, I really think it's important that we continue to posture, which uh, we have right now uh, when it comes to our franchise, the level of humility, the level of uh, servitude towards Halo fans. We shouldn't talk about things when we have when we have nothing to talk about at scale Um, today. This is our first step. We're showing the foundry because it feels right to do so. We want to explain our plans for Halo, attract new passionate developers to our team. The next step will be about talking the games themselves. What is clear is yes, Halo, its games, plural, are in development right now. Where Halo Infinite saw practically the entire studio focus on a single evolving project, Halo Studios is recalibrating. We had a disappointing, uh, a disproportionate focus on trying to create the conditions to be successful in servicing Halo Infinite. However, but switching to Unreal, this allows us to put the focus on making multiple new games at the highest quality possible. I just want to stop right there for a second. This is great. You guys feel confident that this new engine is going to allow you to say focus on game design and game development and not so much on the back end technological aspect, but learn to walk before you try to run. And I guess what I'm trying to say is as someone who loves Halo 4 and 5 and even likes Infinite but has many problems with it, why not just make one Halo game and really fucking kill it? I think like the best thing you could do right now with Halo is, yeah, take Unreal Engine, learn it well, and take the team, this new team that you're hiring and staffing up and getting together and say, all right, guys, let's make a really fucking killer spin-off Halo game. Let's do a really, let's make an ODST game. Let's make a game about Locke. Let's make a game about someone else, right? Let's do that horror Halo flood game that people have been asking about forever. Let's, let's make something like that because it's an opportunity for us to get our feet wet, learn, make mistakes, and, and get better at Unreal Engine. And grow together as a new team because we are as Halo Studios, right? We're a new incarnation. We're not 343. We're not Bungie. We're not working on Slip Space. We're working on Unreal. Let's do a really cool spin off game a la Halo Reach in this new engine as a new team. Fucking kill it. Hear what people have to say about it. Learn. And then we'll take what we've learned and apply that to a proper Halo 7. I think that's the way to go. Maybe that's exactly what they're doing. But they're, they're pretty blunt about saying, hey, we're working on multiple Halo games. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, okay, you got the tech thing figured out. You're on Unreal Engine 5. But you guys haven't really proved you can knock it out of the park with how everything went with Halo Infinite. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's just take it slow and get it right. Let's do one thing really, really well instead of doing a couple things to varying degrees of quality. That's just my take but who knows maybe they'll prove us all wrong i hope they do i love halo i only want good things for halo so i don't know continuing on they say a major part of this shift has been reorganizing the structure of halo studios as a whole in order to give development teams what they need to make something new at the beginning of the day if we build games that our players want to play that's how we'll be successful explains van 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 wick not Vic Van Dyke. He did not say that. He's not, he doesn't care about it. The guy probably doesn't know what a halo is. Uh, that's what should motivate what we build. That's also what the structure has done. We want people that are day in day out making games uh, to be the ones that make the decisions on the game. The team will also be seeking more input from outside the studio on those decisions. We're seeking earlier and earlier, wider and wider feedback from our players. Uh, she continues, We started with the Master Chief Collection, we carried on with Halo Infinite, and now we want to do it even more with our next project. At the end of the day, it's not just how do we evaluate, it's not, um, but it's how do our players evaluate it. 343 Industries was founded to create Halo games, but the impression I get is that in its new incarnation as Halo Studios, the team has been retooled to put the focus entirely on that goal, without distraction, without impediment, uh, to create better games that players' hopes and wishes and hearts uh, of the endeavor 
um, with players, hopes, and wishes, and heart of in, in the endeavor. Whatever. Uh, kind of a weirdly worded sentence. You asked why we consider this a new chapter, says uh, says Studio Head Heinz. Well, we want a singular focus. Everyone in this place is here to make the best games possible. Okay. Done. That's the write-up. On that last point, I just got to say hard disagree. Um, I am a firm believer, whether it's whether it's Halo, Star Wars, whatever the fuck, there are no sacred cows. If we are going to take something like Halo and say, we can't let this die after Halo 3, we got to keep this going forever and always. If you're going to say, we can't let Darth Vader die and that be the end of the story, um, Star Wars has to go on well beyond, what year was that movie? Fucking... 1983 or whatever when when empire strikes no not empire strikes back um return of the jedi you know if you're gonna say we're not gonna end it here we're gonna keep this franchise going forever and ever and ever we will never let it die you gotta you gotta do yourself a favor do not let the fans dictate what you create you need to make the thing you want to make the reason why that last disney star wars movie sucks so much ass is because it was Disney and Lucasfilm re, like trying to slap something together in six months to react to fans going, "Boo, we don't like, we don't like that uh, Last Jedi movie," and that's why that last movie sucks so much. Donkey Dick is because it has no integrity. It is just reaction. It is purely a reaction. The reason why Halo Infinite is so deeply disappointing, in my opinion, compared to Halos Four and Five, is because even though Four and Five are a huge departure from Bungie's Halo, they are consistent they are original and they are a vision of 343 industries which i respect halo infinite is the reaction to halo 5 it is oh you don't like the art style we'll go back to the old one oh you don't like that there's not enough master chief we'll do only master chief oh you didn't like this storyline we'll just fucking ignore the storyline mid story and then do something else we'll just pivot for your enjoyment and then halo infinite comes out and it's still a disappointment and now it's worse than halo 5 being a disappointment because it's a disappointment that isn't your vision. It is a disappointment that is this weird trying to service everyone, trying to please everyone. And so I I want to be optimistic about the future of Halo, but this quote from the studio head makes me very nervous because I, I fucking, and I know this is, again, this is all a PR thing. This whole write-up is for PR. I don't like that this is how movie studios and game studios and everyone likes to operate. Listen, we're, we're listening. We see your tweets. We see your snarky tweets for engagement. We want to please you. We see all the Reddit. Tra- we see the guy with the furry face making the comments on YouTube, and we want to make you happy. Stop doing that, man. Make the game you want to make. You need to get together as a team and say, we are all a group of passionate Halo fans. We're game developers. We're storytellers. We love video games. We love Halo. We have the unique opportunity that 99.9999% of people who make video games will never have to leave a mark on the Halo franchise. What story do we want to tell? How can we push this franchise further with our creative abilities? That is what you should be asking yourself. Not what does Big Dick Slayer 429 on YouTube really want? Oh, look, there here's a comment from Discreet Shadowheart XXX, who says, Halo sucks, bring Bungie back. Halo 3 was OG. Halo 2 was better. I miss games. Don't listen to that motherfucker. I understand you're following the player counts, you know, the retention, the in game transactions, the game sales. I know that's what you're really tracking, but like, don't count out to that. Be, be strong and confident enough to say, We have an idea. We have passion. We have the talent and the tools and the opportunity to build something here. Let's fucking do that. But instead they go, Ooh, you guys, you guys pick on us when we, when we don't give you what you want. So now we're just going to give you what you want. That first of all, it's playing it too safe. That's, that sucks. That's like, that's like, like if some, like if, you know, like, like wishing on a monkey pond saying, I wish I was a career musician. I wish I could make a living being a, a guitarist. And then instead of like writing your own music and performing your own songs live for a living, you get to just do Beatles cover band songs on a fucking cruise ship for the rest of your life. It's like, yeah, there are worse jobs, but like, is that really what you, what you dreamed of when you were 12 years old mastering the guitar? Did you want to play Beatles and Rolling Stone cover songs for drunk 45 year old washed out nine to fivers on a cruise ship? Or did you want to fucking rock, rock the world by writing and performing your own music for the world? It's like, it's kind of like that. It's like, do you want to be 
the Halo cover band. You just want to make you just want to make games that feel like spiritual successors to Halo Two and Three because that's what that's what Dick Lips Four Three Seven said on on YouTube. Or do you want to make your Halo game because Halo inspired you when you were 18 years old and now you have the opportunity to make a Halo game. What are you going to do with it? So that's just, I don't know, man. Maybe I just sound like too, too like head in the clouds, a little too lofty and, and, and I don't know, aspirational about these things. But like, I really truly believe like, listen, man, video games are not important. It's not, this isn't fucking healthcare. This isn't like people's lively. Well, it is people's livelihoods because it's a, it's an industry where people make money, but you know what I mean? Like as an entertainment format, something for us to consume and, and take in, this isn't like, this isn't like a necessity. It's not that important. Like this is just here for our amusement and for our entertainment. And so when it comes to that, it's like the most important thing for my opinion, in my opinion, is that, is that the people creating this stuff feel empowered and inspired to, do unique and original and, and, and powerful things and that they're putting their art out into the world rather than just imitating the things that you want to see because you're nostalgic. Um, if, if we just want Halo 2 again, um, we're getting pretty close to a, a, a reality where you can just spit into a fucking generator. Make me Halo 2 again. Evanescence. Nostalgia. 2005. And then let let fucking AI give you what you want. Let, let them give you your Halo 2.5, okay? But like... If we're going to inject hundreds of millions of dollars and, and change the name to Halo Studios and do all this up and down the aisle thing, like, let's fucking do it right. Give give these guys the opportunity to do something good. And, and have good producers and good leaders who can come in and be like, whoa, 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 whoa. We said make the Halo game you want to make. Don't fucking make Master Chief a furry freak. You know, like, produce the game. Make sure it's right. Make sure you get the right eyes on the game so that you're not going too far off track. I'm not saying turn Halo into a fucking rhythm game. But, you know, give them the give them the opportunity to make something new and unique. So I just I that that comment really rubs me the wrong way and gives me very bad uh, vibes, quote unquote. So I'm just I don't know. I'm I'm I am always team. Let the creator create, you know, like I when a band I love puts out like their seventh album and now they don't sound like the band I used to love. And they, and they went from being like an emo rock band to like an arena rock. I'm talking about you fucking fallout boy. They put out rock and roll is not dead. And I know there are fallout boy fans that love that album. Good for you. I fucking hate that album. I am so happy that album exists because I, as a fan of fallout boy want fucking Pete Wentz and, uh, and all those guys to be able to write their fucking knockoff queen football arena music, because that's what they wanted to write. That's what they wanted to do. And I would rather them have that opportunity and me go, oh, well, they had like three other great records and I'll enjoy those records and move on with my life. I don't need to fucking enslave the four guys of Fallout Boy and be like, no, you work for me, bitch. You keep writing from under the cork tree until I say stop. It's like, that's that's fucking weird. Is that really what you want? You really want these people to just be your bitch and to just keep giving you Empire Strikes Back because you your life is dictated by nostalgia? It's, it's weird, man. My life's dictated by nostalgia. We're all here for the same reasons. That's why I do an Xbox podcast. I grew up loving Xbox. I have fuzzy, warm memories. I love Halo. I love Transformers. That's why I'm bitching about how there's no good Transformers video games. But, you know, we're not here to enslave people and make them do our bidding. Come on, man. That's what robots are for. Um, all right. So, yeah. I, the only thing I didn't really touch on here that I want to say, I guess, is, is the name change, right? I think 343 Industries is a cool name. I know people rag on it because it's like 343 Guilty Spark. That, that's a bad guy. That's the guy that betrays, he betrays the UNSC. He betrays Master Chief. Why would we want to name our studio after that? I get it. But I don't know, 343, maybe not Industries, but like 343i or 343, I thought was a cool name. It was like one of those, like, it's it's ambiguous for people who get it, you get it. Um, it's a reference to the franchise without being so outright. And also it's just like, whether you like the name or not, it's been the name for so long that it's like, why would you fuck with it? And then just changing it to Halo Studios. It's just, it's like that. It's the thing I'm always bitching about. It's like, why, why did we have to gut all the charm and the aesthetic and the fun out of things? Like why, why, why does Chuck E. Cheese need to look like a fucking Apple store today? Like, why can't we just have colors and fun fonts and silly names and cool things anymore like why does everything have to be an industrial fucking hipster craft beer like warehouse thing you know so i feel like changing the name to halo studios it's kind of the same thing it's like oh you fucking you ruined the name you ruined the logo look it sucks now you, congratulations you fucked up so whatever it doesn't matter at the end of the day the name is just the name um i don't give a shit i don't care if they're called master chiefs left nut you know like what, whatever as long as the games are good 
The name can be whatever the fuck you want it to be. But um, yeah, that's silly. I mean, that's that's because again, to reiterate, this is not a new chapter. This is a fresh start. This is a clean cut. Is what this is. Um, so whatever. If you can make good games, make good games. I don't care. The screenshots look weird. Just to touch on those real quick. Um, the the video footage. I highly encourage if you're a Halo fan, you watch this video if you haven't already. Um, it looks very much like you know those YouTube videos that are like. I made Super Mario Bros. in Unreal Engine, and then it's like like weird first person Mario, and it looks like hyper realistic, and it's weird looking. That is exactly what this looks like um, to me, but in Halo version. Um, I, I know Cronky, I know you're gonna write in Jesse. You don't understand what you're saying. Engines don't determine the graphics, engine or whatever. Like the way a game feels or whatever isn't determined by the engine. But I don't know. To me, I'm stupid. Maybe I don't know anything. Whenever I see something that's like just ma- like a tech demo in Unreal. I always go, that looks like Unreal Engine. I don't know. Maybe I, I'm not savvy enough to understand why or why not. But when I see this stuff, it looks like Unreal Engine. And when I'm looking at these screenshots, I'm looking at this video footage, this looks like some fan trying to recreate Halo in Unreal Engine. It does not look like Halo. So to me, it's it's weird. It's too photorealistic. It lacks style. Um, it's too, the graphic fidelity is too focused on being realistic and not enough on being stylized, I guess is, is what I just said. And I'm saying it again. Um, they're st- still doubling down on that. Let's try to make it look like combat evolved instead of doing our own art style. So still kind of weird. Why, why the fuck did Halo just stop looking like Halo five after Halo five? I don't know. I guess we'll never explain. That's not the end of the world, I guess. But yeah, I mean, just the, the water effects, the, the way the energy sword like kind of ripples and looks less like a sword and more like a beam of energy. It's cool. The graphics are very, very nice, but doesn't, doesn't look like Halo at all. Um, so it does look weird to me. Um, uh, again, I don't, fucking care i'm sure they'll be able to this is really just a tech demo i'm sure they'll be able to add their own flair to it over time and whenever we get halo 7 or 8 or whatever the fuck they're gonna call it um hopefully at that point in time um they're able to tool it enough and make it feel and look like halo enough to where we're just like hey cool it's the next halo game we're excited to play it people are happy right that's all that matters um i'm sure microsoft is happy to pay that licensing fee to Epic for this game to just have Halo games made at a more steady clip to have a happier, healthier studio and to be able to get more games out the door and have less upheaval and, and issues on the back end that um, they were experiencing at 343 with everything with slip space and whatnot. So here we go. Fresh start, new name, new engine, new Halo games, plural. And we'll see where it goes, I guess. Uh, Cronky writes in and says, so obviously the big news this week is Halo Studios, the whole Unreal Engine thing. I hate the look of what they're doing. Halo should look should not look photorealistic. It should have some stylized look. Um, am I crazy? This this looks weird. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think you're right, Cronky. That being said, um, this all but confirms a remake of the original game. So, uh, oh yeah, so get your DualSense controllers ready. Oh, Cronky, that's a great point. I'm a fucking idiot. That is, that's actually exactly what this is. They say making multiple games. You're probably right. That is probably, we're going to do... We're going to remake Halo Combat Evolved for PlayStation 5 and for Xbox. We're going to charge 70 bucks for it. And then we're also going to make Halo 7. That's No, you're exactly right. That's that's what this is. You're fucking right. Well, I didn't even think about that. This is why I probably need a co-host is because I don't I don't think. Um, no, that's, yeah. I I don't know what else to say. That yeah, That's, that's, you can't pay me to not believe that that's what this is. That's, yeah. They're making Halo Combat, the, the rumors of them. If, for those who don't remember, a couple months ago, the rumor was, they're exploring making a Halo Combat Evolved remake, but it's not like the one from 2011 where they make everything look prettier and new. It's like a rebuild. Like from the ground up, they are making Halo Combat Evolved from stem to stern, and it's going to be running native for PlayStation 5 in Unreal Engine, and that's probably what they're working on. And yeah, that makes total sense. And they can sell that. They can throw it in the Game Pass for us plebs on Xbox, and they can sell it for 70 bucks a pop on PlayStation, and then we can continue to have our conversation of why even have an Xbox, so... That is probably exactly what that is, and then while they're doing that, they'll work on the next X, uh, the next Halo game, which will probably also be on PlayStation because uh, Satya Nadella fucking hates us all. So cool, that's awesome. That that I, at the end of the day, whatever. I just want new Halo games that that are awesome. I just want Halo games that are inspired, that continue the story, that honor the work that was done before, and that um, have some kind of creative. I don't know, just some take some creative risk. It's okay. Halo set. Here's the thing. Let, let, let me explain something that I really need people to understand. Halo Seven doesn't need to be better than Halo Two. It just needs to be a very good game. You can have a favorite. Chances are, 
There will never, if, if you're a 30, 40 year old man that loves Halo, they will never make a Halo game that you will love more than Halo 2. That's not going to change. We don't need them to try and top Halo 2. We don't need them to try and pretend to be Bungie. We just need them to make really good Halo games that we can all enjoy. That's what, that's that, that's it. Problem is we have this like toxic fucking broken culture where we always think everything is about topping the thing you did before or like everything has to be the successor to or the next level of this prior thing. It's like, no, we just need Halo games that are good, crafted meticulously, loving, respectful of the franchise, respectful of the IP. That's that's all we need. I don't know. And then some other kid who's 17 when this game comes out, Halo 7 or whatever, that can be their favorite Halo game. And then when they're 40, they'll bitch about how Halo 16 isn't as good as Halo 7. But, I don't know, man. Just, just fucking put out some good Halo games and we'll all be good. I'm excited for the future of the franchise. I'm excited that Halo has a future. Uh, but I'm also a little nervous about some of the things we're seeing here and about some of the rumors. You know, PlayStation getting all the Halo games and trying to make games to please old school fans. I don't love that, but we'll see. Let's just see how it goes. These are early days. We are still many years away from new Halo game. Maybe maybe this Halo Combat Evolved from the ground up remake, probably three years out at, at, at earliest. So we'll wait and see. All right, we have one other story this week. Not a whole lot to say about it, but let's get into it. So from VGC, a U.S. judge has issued a permanent injunction injunction order uh, ordering Google to open Android, uh, its app marketplace, to competitors. The ruling, which will come out uh, in, into full force in November, means that Google will not be allowed to block the distribution of third-party Android app stores through Google Play. It will also have uh, the ability to grant third-party app stores access to Google Play's full catalog of apps. That part I find it hard to believe, and it's kind of crazy. The ruling is the most significant development yet in Epic Games' long-running antitrust lawsuit with Google, which start, which um, said on Monday that it's planning to appeal today's verdict. So beginning on November 1st, for a three-year period in the U.S., the following, Google will not be allowed to pay developers to launch apps first and exclusively through the Play Store. It will be barred from offering manufacturers or carriers incentives to pre-install Google Play um, on or not to pre-install rival stores on new devices. Fuck yeah. The company won't be able to force app makers to use Google Play billing. Fuck yeah. It may not require a developer to set the price based on whether Google Play is used. Fuck yeah. Google won't be able to restrict developers from pointing users to external payment options outside of the Play Store. So... This is phenomenal use, and I can news, and I cannot believe uh, what I'm seeing that this is coming from the U.S. government and not like the U.N. or something like that. Because you, usually it's usually it's the European governments that are out there holding companies accountable, and usually the 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 U.S. government is the one that's like, let the companies run all over us, the companies, the freedom of the people, the fucking business, oh big bit, you know. So normally, like this is unheard of because the U.S. is such a fucking bitch country that's owned by corporations and has no fucking backbone and no respect for its people. So it really makes me happy to see the U.S. step in and actually do something for once in their fucking lives. Um, uh, so this is awesome. Um, finally, I wanted to use Google Play. Thank you, fucking God. What this means for Xbox, we don't have to get into it because I have a million things about how this excites me as a Samsung phone user because the more and more I can, like the the less Google I can have on my Android phone, the more I like my Android phone because Google is ugly and I fucking hate them, uh, which is funny because I could just use an iPhone if I didn't like Google, but I don't, I, I, I want to use it. I don't want, I'm stupid. Um, all right, so let's, let's key this in exclusively on how it pertains to Xbox and not get distracted. We know Xbox wants to make an Xbox marketplace, an Xbox app store, an Xbox ecosystem for mobile devices. Don't really know how the fuck that's ever going to happen on, on Apple. Don't like, let's not talk about that. But for Google, which is, you know, Android, the, the major, the, the mobile operating system that is most commonly used around the world. It looks like this is happening. It's all been imminent. So there are already other third party app stores that exist on Android. Uh, The most famous alternative example is that Samsung has an app store that comes pre-installed on all Samsung devices. Um, Pretty much no one fucking uses it except for probably me. Uh, It's pretty useless. I think the only apps I'm able to get off of it are like uh, are like Samsung's proprietary apps, of course. And then like um, a couple like banking apps. And uh, and I think Marvel Snap is like the only video game I'm able to get off there anyway. 
Um, but it's it's pretty much a useless play, um, app store. But it looks nicer, and I prefer it to Google Play. So if I if I can use it, I always do. Uh, but this will theoretically allow all the uh, Android phone makers, you know, the Oppos and the fucking uh, the Xiaomi's and Huawei's and shit, because there are no Japanese or American Android developers or creators left at this point. It seems like. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the big one, Samsung over in Korea, um, the ability to really invest in their own marketplace. But for Xbox and Microsoft, this is the green light for them to do that Xbox marketplace. So you'll basically be able to download from the Google Play Store an Xbox marketplace app. And then that app will allow you to buy Xbox games through that app onto your Android device. It'll allow you to access Game Pass cloud storage, Xbox features, everything. And then you can also download games a la carte. So you would, in theory, if they make Xbox games native for phone, you'd be able to like download your Halo Unreal Engine 5 Combat Evolved Ground Up remake on your Samsung Galaxy S34, whatever the fuck you're using, and play it off of that 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 uh, Xbox marketplace that you have on your Android device. Um, you'd also be able to basically just do all your Microsoft bidding on Microsoft's own app store on your Android phone without having to interface with Google's app store really. Um, so this would be really fucking cool because basically everyone's really pigeon held and, and limited based on having to appeal to Google. And this deters a lot of other companies from wanting to even do app stores on Android because there's pretty much no value in it. If everyone is basically forced to use the Google play store and the Google play store is pretty much 99.9% .9 of what everyone wants, everyone's just going to go to Google play. But if Instagram and YouTube and all these other apps that are available on Google play are suddenly available on any app store, it's going to make it a lot more compelling for other companies to be like, well, we're going to make our own app store. You know, it's like, think about how maybe this isn't the best example because this is an example of Google dominating, but you know, you get a windows PC and it, it used to give you internet Explorer. And now it gives you edge. And a lot of people go, I don't, I don't want to use Microsoft edge. I, I want a different browser. Okay. Well, that's great. Boot up your PC, go on to Microsoft edge and download Google Chrome. And now you can delete edge and you can use Google Chrome for the rest of your life. That's, that's the web browser you want to use. That's the one you can use. So this is kind of that equivalent for Android phones where it's like, you don't want to use Google's play store app. Well, use it one time to download the Microsoft app or the Samsung store app or whatever. And now you can tell the Google one to go fuck off. And this is the one you use because all the apps are available on all the platforms. And that would be really ideal. Now, I don't know how fast we're going to see that change over. I don't know how smoothly that's going to work out, but that is great news for all of us um, who are waiting for Xbox to launch that, that app store on mobile devices that they've been teasing and that they've said they want to do for a while. So they're probably waiting on like this kind of movement in order for them to be able to take action. So I wouldn't be surprised if maybe sometime in early to mid 2025, we see the announcement of that, that Microsoft app store for Android. Um, although I thought we were expecting that sometime this year. So in any case, this this is really good news for the future of that. If you're waiting on that, and and I personally am as someone who uses an Android gaming tablet with my Logitech G Cloud, um, I, any excuse to not to use Google. Like I, I always say, the only Google thing I ever want on my phone is YouTube. Fuck off! I don't want Google Photos. I don't want Google Drive. I don't want Google, Gmail, the Google Play Store. Any. Get it all out of my fucking face. I hate it all. Not because I hate Google as a company. I do, but they're they're really no better or worse than any of the other tech companies. They're all the same. Really just because Google's design language is so ugly. That's really all it comes down to. It's just so fucking ugly. I don't know how you can be so powerful and so big and be so ugly. Man, like, say what you want. Dude. Apple, beautiful. All, all their apps, their fonts, their, and their ecosystems, everything. Always so pretty. Google, you make such ugly shit. You're so disgusting. You should be so fucking ashamed of yourself. Go go to beauty school. Go go to beauty phone school and make a beautiful fucking... Even those Google phones, like the Pixel phones, I'm like, ah, they, they look kind of okay. And then you see the Google logo on the back of them. I'm like, ugh, ugh they're so gross. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I, I just hate everything about their design language. It's so gross. Um, all right, this isn't about that. We don't have to talk about that. All right, let's move on. So that's all of our big news for the week. You guys, let's wrap up with like two or three quick uh, stories important enough to make the podcast, but not important enough to mourn their own discussion. This is just the important enough news. I think it's all about Sega, actually. Yeah, it's two stories. They're both about Sega. All right, this first one here. Sega has revealed that they are officially working on a sequel to Alien Isolation. 
That's for Kronky. I know he's excited. The announcement was made on Monday to coincide with the 10th anniversary of the original game's release. I cannot believe that game's 10 years old. The sequel is in early development at Creative Assembly, according to the studio who created the AI Hope, uh, who has also directed Alien Isolation. I just fucking had a fucking aneurysm. According to creative director Al Hope, that's a human being, he's not AI, he's a human, Al Hope, who also <laughs> directed Alien Isolation. Our, he says, quote, our 10-year anniversary, um, it seems only fitting to let you know that we have uh, heard your distress calls loud and clear. Today, I'm delighted to confirm on behalf of our team that the sequel to Alien Isolation is in early development. We look forward to sharing more details with you when we're ready. Again, this is a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier. This is a announcement for the people, but really what they're saying is uh, Creative Assembly got gutted after that, um, that game got canceled that they made. You remember what it was? It was like Hunters or whatever. It was that like, I, I played it a couple of times. It was that game where you like collected Sega loot and it was like a free to play multiplayer game. Uh, it was something called Hyenas, right? That's what it was called. Remember that game got fucking gutted and canceled in the last minute. So yeah, this is their way of saying, all right, we need to rehire. People got laid off. That game got canceled. We're kind of in a restart zone. Um, we're going back to basics. Let's go do a sequel to Alien Isolation. Guys, please come apply to work at Creative Assembly. We need people to work on this new game. Here it is. It's called Alien Isolation 2. Yay, 10 years later. Come on, let's let's do this thing. So that's really what this announcement is about. This game is far away from coming out, but exciting news nonetheless for fans of the game. Next up, and lastly, Universal Pictures is working on a movie based on Sega's Shinobi franchise. Deadline reports that the film will be directed by Sam Har- Hargrave, who previously directed Netflix's movie Extraction and its sequel. Uh, screenplay will be by Ken Kobayashi, the writer and producer of Apple TV Plus comedy series Sunny. Uh, no name on, no info on like when it would come out or anything like that, but this is one video game movie adaptation that I would actually be on board for. I feel like you could come up with like a Mortal Kombat tier, like quality tier type movie for this, like where it's like not too serious, but not too goofy, and it's like dumb fun action like i feel like this could be a fun action flick so i'm 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 open to a shinobi movie i feel like this could work so there's that that's it for all of our news everything this week guys time for the last and best part of the show the comments the shout outs you know what comes from youtube.com you head on over youtube.com slash xbox on podcast that is at xbox on podcast on youtube.com click on the latest episode of the podcast don't be cute no comments on episode 187 don't care Click on the latest episode of the podcast and leave a comment. Say anything nice, mean, anything in between. I don't give a shit. We've been getting lots of mean comments lately. Lots of drive-by comments. Lots of first-time commenters just saying some shit. Um, I don't know, really. I I guess this is a a problem of my own creation where I've just allowed, by being a crazy, unhinged piece of shit person on this podcast, I have allowed those kinds of people to get attracted to this podcast and then come and leave their own ridiculous comments. So we do have a couple of those to get through this week. I don't know why we just keep getting this shit, but six comments. So let's jump in. We already did a couple earlier in the show. So we got six more comments to get into. Um, starting off with Cronky talking about Starcraft from last week when we said uh, there's the report of a Starcraft shooter in development. He said there may well be uh, they they may well uh, may as well make a Starcraft first person shooter. There will never be another RTS from Blizzard. Their RTS team is gone now. That being said, Modern Blizzard is the worst AAA developer in the industry, so the game would be trash. I hate Blizzard more than I hate pretty much anything. Uh, Kronky, it's funny that you say that because you weren't you the one asking me to play Overwatch recently, you fucking little weeaboo? Um, no, I don't think that was Overwatch. I think I'm just selling you out. I, I don't know. I don't remember what game it was. Uh, I mean, hey, I agree I, that that Blizzard is not, not the greatest these days, but... I don't think they're the worst developer. Are you fucking kidding me? There's there's way worse developers. Have you seen Ubisoft? They're getting bought out by the fucking by the by the by the fucking communists. So that's dumb. I don't know. I don't agree that would be the worst thing ever, but I do agree that I am less I'm less optimistic about modern Blizzard doing a StarCraft shooter than I am about early to mid 2000s uh, Blizzard doing a StarCraft shooter. Obviously, I would prefer the latter over the former. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, this is an opportunity for them to, to, to do something good, right? They, they, the, they've done nothing I've given a shit about for a while. This would be a really good opportunity for them to do something special. So I, I'm optimistic about the opportunity. So let's talk about kids today and their, their video game preferences. Cargo Runner writes in again, following up about a comment written in by Peter Lefnuts last week. And says, Peter Lefnuts, I have to disagree with you. I think only young kids play. Uh, I think only young kids play anything. My friend's kid turned down. Yeah, I think you were talking about how like kids will play anything. I don't remember. I'm sorry, Peter Lefnuts. I had, I had to go back and remember what you were talking about. 
Cargo Runner says, my friend's kids turned down my offer of an Xbox Series X or S at launch. They really wanted to play Spider-Man, and so they wanted a PS4. I was not offering them a Series S or a PS4. It was a Series S or nothing, and they chose nothing. They just, they just didn't want a console that could now play Spider-Man. They only want to play the game that are being discussed at school or the ones they consider are cool. They used to get Game Pass for Christmas, but they just didn't use it. They're fussy about what they eat, what they wear, what music they listen to, and what games they play. Oh, yeah, that's because we were having a conversation about how um, how how like uh, uh, system sellers and like exclusive games aren't really like the main thing anymore. It's not like really what drives hardware sales and all that. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's absolutely about these, this is still a thing. We got to remember that we're all adults now. We're in our twenties, thirties, forties, whatever. Um, we're not, we're not the core demographic. When, when, when the advertisements come out and stuff, they're not really trying to reach to us. You know, this morning that I record the podcast, Nintendo just announced the Nintendo Alarmo. And I just want to let you know, aside from a very select few people, that's not that's not for adults. That's that's for kids. Okay, and we're all a little out of touch. You don't know you're out of touch because you know you know because things around you remind you you are out of touch. And we can all like Xbox or whatever, or pick this over that based on the things we're seeing on Reddit and our opinions and preferences and the the hardcore gaming scene and all that. But at the end of the day, we're all removed. You know, hopefully, unless maybe your teacher or something, we're all kind of removed from what it's like to be in the seventh grade at this point, right? So we don't really know what kids are talking about in the halls and this, the, the, the logic and the reason behind why kids gravitate towards what they gravitate towards. But yeah, I, you, you can't tell me that exclusive games aren't selling hardware. I mean, this is, this is why Xbox is shooting themselves in the foot because there are no exclusive games. They're giving everything to PlayStation. But you're going to fucking tell me that Spider-Man on PlayStation isn't a huge reason why kids today are like, yeah, fuck Xbox. I want a PlayStation. Of course. Because those games are of a very high quality and they're very, very good. And... People fucking love Spider-Man. So, of course, that's going to draw people and make people go, yeah, Xbox. And they're going to be on TikTok and YouTube and shit, and they're going to follow what the people they like on those platforms say. That is how it is when you're a kid. Everyone just kind of, they don't know why they like stuff. They just like it. It's like when you're, like, it's like that weird phenomenon. Like, like who are, like, the biggest fans of, like, hip-hop and, like, music that's all about, like, sex and drugs and guns and shit? It's like, when you, when you think about, like, Ariana Grande just singing about getting fucking railed in the ass on her kitchen counter. It's like, yeah, her biggest fan base is, like, 13-year-old kids. Because I don't fucking know kids are weird. They just like that shit. They're just, I don't know, a kid on TikTok said this is cool. The, the, the YouTube, this is what the kids in school are listening to. I like it. Ariana Grande, yeah. Talk about you have a lot of money and you don't have to pay attention to the rules because you're a girl. It's, it, I don't know. They just like that shit. I can't, I can't explain it. There's no logic to kids. They like what they like. And that's just how that shit goes. I don't, but the, you know, it's always like the ultimate example of how we're like out of touch and we just don't know. So I, you can totally see that if you're dude, I can only imagine this kind of logic still tracks. If you're like a kid in the seventh grade and kids are like, oh, did you play God of War? And you're like, no, I have an Xbox. Like you have an Xbox. You're poor. It's like, that's dude. Tell me that's not the kind of shit kids are talking about in school. Of course it's funny as hell, but it's, <laughs> it's probably still how it, how it goes. Right. Um, so I don't know, dude, game, uh, games matter. System sellers matter. Exclusive content matters. If Xbox can, you know, if, if Starfield hit the way Skyrim hit, you fucking kidding me? People be like, you playing, Sky, you playing Starfield? No, I only have PlayStation. Like, haha, you're dumb, you're poor. Like, that's that's what the conversation would be. But Xbox can't muster out a fucking exclusive game on that echelon to save their fucking lives for a multitude of reasons. But um, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that keeps PlayStation always above Xbox. Is it, They got Spider-Man, we don't. So, I don't know, man. It's exclusives matter. Exclusives matter. High quality, high caliber, exclusive content that resonates with modern audiences. That shit really matters. That's why we need to spend less time, hard, like banking on Halo Seven, Eight, Nine, and more time trying to figure out what's the next thing we do. You know, we can have Halo Seven, Eight, Nine. I'll take that all day. But we need, to, we need to focus on finding out what's the next unique, brand new, from the ground up thing we're going to do that's going to get today's audience engaged. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Thank, thank you for hanging in, Cargo Random. Uh, oh, yeah. Here's, some, here's like a slew of those weird comments we got this week. I don't, I don't understand what's happening. Johnny Cooper writes in and says, uh, I said, thank you for being concerned for my video game well-being. 
uh, he, his comment says, I can't believe you go through the trouble of finding a Marvel game on Xbox just to play the mediocre Marvel Midnight Suns. Why not just buy a PlayStation 5? Even a used or refurbished one would let you play Spider-Man 2. Oh, I didn't know that the used PlayStation 5s could play Spider-Man 2. That's good. That's good uh, information, Johnny Cooper. Thank you for letting me know that. You need to stop being an Xbox fanboy and stop glazing a company. What the fuck is that? Is that a new term? Glazing a company that wouldn't even help your help you pay your rent. Uh, you're making your life harder by playing cheap Marvel games on Xbox just because Sony's leftover uh, can't... <laughs> And go to your console. Stop letting Xbox define your identity and get a PS5. Or you can stick with that laughable console and watch PlayStation 5 vans enjoy AAA Marvel games while you stick with dollar menu Marvel games. <laughs> he didn't put ha ha ha, but I just thought it'd be appropriate. Um, and I, I don't know what to say to this. I love, I think my favorite um, line here though is what, uh, I think glazing probably, I don't want to think about what that means. Um, my, my two favorite lines here are, um, stop glazing a company that wouldn't even help you pay your rent. Uh, I guess what you're saying is like a company that you don't work for, like you, you don't work for them. Why are you, why are you defending them so much? Maybe that's what you mean. But I also interpret that as like, are you saying like, because Xbox doesn't pay me to do this show, uh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't like it or something. I don't know. Whatever. The funnier part is the next sentence where you say, you're making your life harder by playing cheap Marvel games on Xbox. <laughs> That's so good, dude. I I just love the idea of it's like, what are your woes and struggles in life? Well, I want I want to play Spider Man too, but I only got an Xbox, so this is just what we're gonna have to work with. <laughs> it's just, just like my dude, my life's not harder. Marvel Midnight's I don't know if you've played it. You're probably just aping opinions you heard online, but Marvel Midnight Suns is a pretty fucking great game. Uh, and yeah, I would love to play Spider Man too, and I will play Spider Man too next year when it comes to PC because P- PlayStation puts all their games on PC now. Um, so d- yeah, d- don't, don't worry. I'll play Spider-Man too. I'm sure it's fucking great. I have no doubt. It's a great game. Um, and I don't know, Johnny Cooper, uh, who, whom I've never met and know nothing about. Maybe if you spent a little more time, um, looking after yourself, uh, <laughs> you'd, you'd mentally be in a better place than having to tell people you don't know on an Xbox podcast, um, how they need to live their life because, uh, I'm, yeah, it's just it's fucking weird. It's weird doing this kind of comment. It's just a, uh, hi, I've never met you, Johnny. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself next time. Are you a, uh, are you like a, are you like a fisherman? Are you like a, are you like a, st- a stockbroker? Are you a, uh, like a pedophile or something? You're fucking free. Come into my comments. Tell me how to, how to play my video games, brother. Uh, but no, I'll, I'm gonna have a great week watching NHL and playing Marvel Midnight Sun. So, uh, also John. John Rapey, I'm I'm not making this name up. John Rapey, R A P E Y. Bro's got to play Marvel. Is this the same guy? Is this like a second account? You say, Bro's got to play Marvel Midnight Suns because he's on Xbox. LOL. I swear, all you Xbox users are the same. Uh, always justifying playing on that fridge. It's like when poor people say, We don't have to buy that. We can make it at home. You know? Uh, they always find a way to make something work and act like it's the real deal. Let's keep it real, Jesse. Xbox has the drop games on PlayStation now. It has to drop games on PlayStation now uh, because they uh, because they have to. They didn't need to back in the 360 days when they were a big deal, but not anymore. And now that Halo is getting made in Unreal Engine, you know PlayStation port is coming. Oh, damn. Even John Rapey fucking connected those dots. Now I feel especially stupid. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, same advice uh, I gave to Johnny Cooper. Maybe focus a little more on your own life, buddy. It's not... <laughs> why Why do you care that I like to play on Xbox? What the fuck does it matter? It's not like I'm like, I like to kidnap small children and then and then debone them and cook them for dinner. It's just the food I enjoy eating. Like, your, your opinion about what I like isn't really necessitated or warranted here. It's like, this is an entertainment podcast for people who are enthusiasts of Xbox. What does it say about you as a human being that you're like, I'm going, I hate Xbox. I'm going to go find an Xbox podcast and listen to it so I can it, it, intently, so I can find something he says at the 47 minute mark of the podcast and leave a nasty comment about it because I can't even call this a drive by comment because in both your cases, you guys are referring to me playing Marvel Midnight Suns which is something I talked about like halfway through the podcast last week. So that means 
not only did you see my podcast, but you clicked on it and listened to it and then left the comment. That's fucking weird, man. What does that say about you? <laughs> like, I, I like PlayStation, so this is a bad example because I, I like PlayStation. And when I meet people that have PlayStation 5, I say, good for you because I'm not a fucking mentally handicapped person who judges people based on their video game preferences. I only do it jokingly when I'm laughing about PC and stuff. But this would be like me going out of my way. Or Actually, let's use PC as the example because I do jokingly always rag on PC players, which I don't give a shit. If you play PC, that's whatever. Fucking that's your preference. That's your decision. Who do I? What do I care? But that would be like if I went out of my way to find a video game podcast all dedicated to PC gaming and then listened to 50 minutes of it and then said, <laughs> Jason, co-host of PC Gamer Magazine podcast, you're so stupid. You said your kid asked um, if he could have a gaming PC because he saw that you play video games on PC and you said, I will help you build one. We can build a PC together, my son, whom I love. You're such a piece of shit father. You should have bought him a PlayStation 5. Don't you know that PlayStation 5s can be bought for used pricing now? You stupid father. Your fucking son will grow up to resent you because you are stuck in the past. Playing on the computer, which is where I do my taxes, I play on the PlayStation 5 where I have... Supercell processing, thanks to Mark Cerny and his ingenuity. You are stupid, empathetic. Same old game, things will never change. I am better than you. Like, that's a little fucking weird, right? That's that's a little weird. Maybe I could, like, go feed my cat or mow my lawn or, like, learn physics or something, for God's sake. Anything is a better use of your time than going out of your way to find enthusiast podcasts about things you don't like to then learn about these hosts you don't know, to then leave hate mail in the comment section. You're free to do whatever you want, man. As you can clearly see, I will read your comment at your fucking expense, and we can laugh about it. But that's weird, man. I'm just going to go listen to a podcast about working out so I can judge the people for their fucking protein shakes because uh, that's how much I hate working out. That's how much I hate protein shakes. Anyway. Justin, the sl the slave catcher, Justin, the slave catcher, catching slaves. Are you an enslaver, Justin? Justin, the slave catcher, like you catch slaves and then enslave them or like you catch slaves and then free them. Like, I, I got to know a little bit more about your fucking career, Justin, the slave catcher. That's a fucked up name. That's it is at the very least. It's a name that demands uh, answers because it definitely presents a lot of questions. It's fucking that's a whole that's a whole statement to be making, Justin the slave catcher. Uh, all right, this is the last last funny one, but uh, real quick, having an Xbox podcast in 2024 feels a bit like running a GameStop. It's a relic of a bygone era. I think you should consider switching your focus to PlayStation. That's a platform that is still generating a lot of buzz. The only time Xbox truly felt valuable was during the Xbox One year. No. <laughs> Xbox One years when advanced replacement scams were rampant. I personally profited quite a bit off the situation. Tingles my fingers together. What were you what were your thoughts on Xbox's modding scene during the Xbox 360 era? A modded Xbox 360 was essentially a golden ticket, granting ex access to free Xbox Live, unreleased video games, and of course, cheat codes. Well, Justin the Slaver, um when the Xbox 360 was out, I was busy being um in middle school. And I was having fun with my, my friends, uh, friends that I made at church and school. And we were playing Halo and Call of Duty and Guitar Hero together. Um, we were drinking sugary drinks and eating snacks in late hours of the nights on Fridays and Saturdays and having good times on Xbox Live or at friends' houses um, during sleepovers. And we were, like, enjoying, you know, video games because we were kids and we were trying to have fun with our lives. Uh, you know, for Christmases and birthdays, I would beg my parents for the latest video game I wanted to play. Um... That's what I, that's where I was during the Xbox 360 modding scene era. I was like trying to be a fucking 13 year old and enjoy my life. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I should have been profiting off of the, uh, <laughs> should have been profiting off the, uh, the, what, what did you say? The advanced replacement scam, uh, uh, a stupid of me not to have been doing that. I'm so such, such an idiot. I should have been profiting off the, the modding, the modding Xbox life. Holy fuck, these people aren't real. <laughs> um, yeah, and as for the advice, I, I genuinely do appreciate it. Just to let you guys know, 
Uh, I am going to take feedback from the audience, especially to those of you that have been listening to a long time that are regular commenters and listeners. Write in, let me know what you think. Should I rename it the PlayStation on Bidu Beat podcast? You know, PlayStation on Bidu Beat. Like, should I, should we, should we change the podcast? What do you guys think? Uh, I just, I'm just a fucking hack, you know, over here podcasting about the video game brand that I like and that I have a personal investment in just because it's, it's, it's a hobby and a, and an entertainment sink for me that makes me happy. Um, I've been making the mistake of doing that all these years when I should just be podcasting about PlayStation, a, a brand of gaming that I also like, but don't feel nearly as enthusiastic or passionate about, um, just because, you know, I want to garner support and I don't want to be a bygone, uh, relic. You know, I want to, I want to be, I want to be in the know. I want to be, um, what's it? What's re- relevant? That's the term they always use to, to insult people online. I want to be relevant. So should I change? Should I just, should next week without any ad- advisement or, 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 uh, advanced notice, should I just upload episode one of PlayStation on, or better yet, let's just, the next episode, we'll just gaslight all you guys. And the next episode will just be PlayStation on. And we'll just act like nothing ever. Welcome to PlayStation on the podcast with one host about one platform, PlayStation. And then we'll, I'll just be like, and for episode 281, we're going to talk about, is Nathan Drake gay? If there's more than three people in The Last of Us Part 3, are they really The Last of Us? Sounds like they're reproducing to me, you know, like whatever, and more. And then like the intro song will be like, I don't know, what's an iconic PlayStation song? Uh, you know, like fucking Mario Bros or whatever the hell they play over there. And then just, we'll just get into run. I'll just, I'll just pretend like we won't mention Xbox on. We won't talk about Halo. We'll just pretend it's always been a PlayStation podcast. And then um, probably be like number three on the on the iTunes charts uh, after doing that because then I'll be relevant and I can profit off of uh, off Ponzi schemes or whatever the fuck you're talking. Anyway, Josh Cavallo writes in with our final comment of the week and says. Um, a little uh, update, uh, response to Tim Doyle, who wrote in recently about paying to play games online. Now, Tim Doyle was talking about how it's like, it kind of just doesn't make sense that we pay money to play games online, but on PC, you don't have to pay for that. Um, Josh writes in and says, I agree with Tim that paying for online multiplayer can feel like a scam, especially when you're just trying to play with friends. While I personally do pay for a yearly subscription, I understand the frustration. It's even worse if you're paying for services like PlayStation Plus or Game Pass and consistently are losing online matches. It can feel like you're paying to get beaten. Um, yeah, I guess so. Listen, man, we talked about it last week. Here's the thing. I agree with you. I agree with Tim. Um, paying to have to play games online, like Xbox Live, PS Plus, having to pay in order to, like, play Call of Duty online with your friends, a a game you've already spent money on, yeah, it, it sucks. It's stupid. Um, Especially because you can't even say like, well, it costs money to keep those servers running, costs money to keep the infrastructure in place. But like, yeah, but it's, but it's free on PlayStation. So why don't they just, you know, why don't they just bake that into the cost of the game that that money goes towards, you know, the money makes Sony makes off selling games on the storefront, the money Activision makes off selling you a copy of Call of Duty. Why don't they just factor that money into like the cost of operating these games online? Yeah, there's no reason, uh, Josh. There's no reason, Tim. There's no real reason. It's it, Xbox saw an opportunity where they could charge money for something, so they did, and they got away with it because millions of people said, I want that. I'll subscribe to Xbox Live, and they did. And then PlayStation said, oh, you can, whoa, 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 you can charge money for that? And so they tried it, and they got away with it because millions of people on PlayStation said, yeah, I'll pay for PlayStation Plus, for sure. And... That's what happened. If Xbox Live came out and everyone said, that's cool, but I'm not paying 10 bucks a month for that. Fuck that. Or if PlayStation Plus came out and people said, we used to get this for free. Why are you charging us money now? And then everyone unsubscribed or didn't subscribe or didn't pay. um, Xbox and PlayStation would have responded by saying, okay, okay, we fucked up. It's free now. You can play online for free. But we all subscribed and paid. And so now they're like, yeah, fuck you. That's what we do now. So, I mean, it's just like a, they, they, Microsoft tested to see if they could get away with something. They got away with it. And companies have a fiduciary obligation to make money. So that's really the long and the short of it. Um, I agree with you guys. It sucks. I agree with you guys that it shouldn't be that way. I wish it was different, but this is the way it is. Um, and I'm not saying if you don't like it, go play PC um, because that's an unrealistic thing to say. If, if you don't enjoy playing on PC and you're already sunk in and set in with PlayStation and Xbox and that's where you're happy... I get it. It just sucks. But these, this has been the norm for so long at this point. It's like, yeah, it just, it just is what it is. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. It just is what it is, but totally agree. I wish it wasn't that way. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it is a funny way to put it when you're like, I'm, I'm literally paying, you know, you're like the, the guy who only gets like five hours, if that a week to play video games, because you're adult who contributes to society and you work a job and you raise a family and you're not like listening to podcasts of subject matters you don't like so that you can leave nasty comments. And you know, you're like being a, a normal human being who contributes to society. And then you come home and it's like, ah, oh, finally it's Wednesday night. This is the night where I get two hours to play Call of Duty. My wife knows this is this is the one night where I get to just be left alone to do this thing I like. This is this is me time. All right, let's hop in. Then you hop in and it's like, boom, you got shot by th- this guy whose name is the N-word somehow in 2024. And it's like, what the fuck? Ah, all right, res- respawn. All right, do-do-do-do. You just got shot in the face by some guy who... Uh, is 13 years old and listens to that Ariana Grande song where she talks about getting fucked in the ass on the kitchen counter. It's like, that sucks. All right, uh, well, fuck it. Um, hmm. I used to be good at this game. All right, let me just, uh, let me just go into a non-ranked mode. You just got fucked in the ass by some guy with the, with the fucking Snoop Dogg skin. It's like, all right, fuck this game. I, I get it, that sucks. And you're paying 10 bucks a month for the honor to do that. I get it. But, uh, I guess the lazy answer would be, get good, bro. Um, the long extended answer is, just, I, just, I don't know what to say. I, we're not, listen, there are many problems in the world that we're not going to solve here on the Xbox on podcast. And this is among them. Um, what, what was it? I said at the beginning of the show, uh, why can't you just focus on a real problem? Like, like homelessness, huh? Why you got to focus on paying for Xbox live now? It just, I mean, yeah, I think we're all in agreement, right? It sucks. It is what it is, but it sucks. But Thank you for writing in. I do appreciate it. And thank you all for listening, for writing in. Hopefully we get uh, some more level-headed people like like you, Josh, and uh, fewer Justins and John John the Rapist and John the Slave. Dude, we got fucking, we got slavers and rapists in the comments here telling me that I'm crazy for like an Xbox. Let that sink in. You guys have a great week. Be well. Um, not not the slavers and the rapists. You guys go, go fuck off. But uh, be well. Take care of yourselves. If you're out there in Florida, I know we got some Florida listeners. This is a podcast that draws a Florida listenership. I don't know why. Maybe just because it gets recommended to you due to where I up. I don't know how the internet works. In any case, I hope you're well. I hope you're safe. Um, take care. You know, follow the advisement if you're in a if you're in a fucking evacuation zone. Evacuate, please, for the love of Christ. Um, but uh, yeah, be well, be good, eat some yummy food, play some good video games, enjoy your lives. And until next week, power your dreams.